Hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, glad to see so many uh, people logging into that meeting. Welcome to another uh, Learn with the Nerds session here. We're going to be, we're talking about hopefully, right? Hopefully this doesn't sound weird and foreign, but we're going to be talking about the Power BI service, right? We're going to look at this from a more from an administration perspective. So hopefully that's what you signed up for. I know some of you just come to all of those Learn with the Nerds as we kind of just kind of bounce around topic wise, but very excited here to have you uh, joining me for these next couple of hours together, right? So that's the topic we're going to be covering. Um, real quick, just make sure, guys, uh, as part of the class itself, you're here watching it through YouTube. There should be a, a little link for you in the description there that will download a zip file that contains effectively the PDF or the, yeah, the PDF of the slides I'll be going through. I've actually added an extended version. Of the, of the PowerPoint I'm going through for yourselves. So it goes into greater detail in certain categories, but obviously we only have a certain amount together. So I've summarized it what I'm gonna go with through you guys, but you actually get more additional details. There's links to white papers, the actual, some, some of the objects, because primarily this session is gonna be more conversational and more exploratory, right? Since it's administration, it's about knowing where to go, how to turn on certain settings, how to infer, enforce certain policies and how to do things like audit logs and stuff like that. But there are a couple of hands-on scenarios that we're going to be going through. So as part of that, in those resources, I have provided the very same reports that I'll be utilizing today. There's not a ton, but they're in there. The one thing I do want to kind of mention, and I know it'll be asked, so I'll put it here right now, and it's actually going to come up right here, um, is that this session is being recorded, guys. So when you after today's over, it takes a little bit for the encoding to go on, but then we will have this on-demand video available for consumption. And even though I'll be doing some examples, like there'll be a little moment where I go into Power BI, I might even open up a little PowerShell. My recommendation is this is not going to be delivered in a way that you are meant to be following along. There's a lot of concepts, a lot of uh, topics we're going to be going through. So I'm just going to be moving at that pace where I can deliver and give this information. All the while, we have a good friend, colleague, you guys are probably all familiar with him. Devin Knight is hiding in the shadows in the background, watching that chat, that chat, trying to answer your questions. Um, so definitely download those resources. But remember, this is not really a session that's meant to be followed along like some of our past ones. But that's okay. It's recorded. So you can go back if you did want to kind of do those examples for yourself, you can. So for any logistical things, like if you like, oh, this Power BI is not opening for me, um, it was curated in the most current version of it, but we're not going to really be doing any technical res like issue resolving within this call, as once again, it's going to be available on demand in our on-demand learning platform. Uh, you'll probably see some banners related to that. And uh, if you're unfamiliar with our on-demand learning platform, I'll give you more details uh, post our break, which as you can see today, 11 o'clock Eastern is what we're going with. We're going to go till 2 Hopefully, I give it a little bit of extra time before, so maybe there's some questions we can dig into it. And usually, we take a break right smack dab in the middle, so I usually aim for around that 12.20 to 12.30 to take a nice little 15-minute break, so hopefully, you can stick with me until that moment. So that's what we're going to be going through, guys. Power BI administration, hopefully, you're going through the process of getting that download going, but uh, like I said, more sit back, relax, let me take you on this journey think and focus around what we're talking about. That'll help promote and prompt some questions. Um, and then, you know, hopefully uh, here and there, Devin will kind of poke me and I'll see if I can answer those. But a lot of times what we end up doing, since there's so many of you, is we actually respond to some of these questions post the actual class itself. So what are we gonna be covering here, right? We're gonna be getting into Power BI licensing. To start off the bat, this conversation should go relatively quick, but depending on what you've been, how you've been paying attention, if whether you've been keeping your finger on the pulse of what's new and up to date with Power BI, you might be a little bit out of date or behind on what's going on here. So we're just gonna have a general discussion around it. Uh, once again, for full transparency in today's session, um, this is an administration session. So there is a lot here that does require elevated permissions, right? I am gonna be moving through the admin portal. I'm gonna be modifying and adjusting the tenant settings. I have a small little scenario where we actually look at a premium capacity. Uh, I'm gonna be going into the Office 365, the Compliance Center, the Admin Center. So we are gonna be going to a lot of areas where it is elevated permissions. I'm inside of my environment, so I'm in a safe little place for me and Pragmatic Works. 
Uh, so the areas as well that we're going to aren't meant to just someone to stumble across and make changes because these are organizational changes that would impact everybody. So that's also another reason why this is more of a, hey, sit back and uh, sit back, relax and enjoy because we're going to be going into some pretty critical areas of Power BI and Office 365. All right. So we're going to be getting into licensing. We're going to talk about some workspace stuff. We're going to get into the conversation around the data gateway. I do have my data gateway installed. I'm going to go through the process, talk about that process. Um, I'm not going to install it in this call because since it's live and we only have so much time doing a live install for a service, Lord knows what could happen. So mine's there ready to go, but we'll have that discussion. Uh, of course, we're going to talk a little bit more around the security aspect of it. This will include things like row level security. We're going to talk about multi-factor authentication, um, auditing. There's kind of two kind of different ways we can go about this. A little conversation around deployment pipelines and the idea of certifying and endorsing data sets. And who knows, sometimes there's little questions that pop up that throw us in another little direction. Depending on the time, I'll see if I can address those. But don't forget, when we have content around tons of other things, like if you're interested in something like data flows, I did a learn with the nerds about a year ago on that. So check it out, right? So we've got lots of other things. If you're a newcomer to these learn with the nerd events, make sure you check out. We have tons of previous ones, right? So check those out. So let's dive right in. All right, let's start off the bat right now talking about licensing options. Now, I've left some items on here as we're going to see that I wouldn't describe as, um, what's the term I want to use here, as legacy by any means, but really I'm talking about this item right here, right? So real case, I'm going to keep that highlighted as I talk about this. But when we talk about individual licensing, we're effectively talking about the items that I'm going to indicate just here in purple, right? These are things that can be assigned to an individual. You can be a free trial user, a pro user, or you can have a premium per user license. This can always be checked when you're in the service. Let's assume you're like not an administrator. If you want to be like, well, what kind of license do I have? In the upper right corner, when you're logged into the Power BI service, there's always a little silhouette of your persona that you're logged in with, and it will tell you your license there. This is also potentially where you could sign up for some trials if you'd like to. Maybe you're a free user. If you hit the try a trial out, it'll actually let you try Power BI Pro for 60 days. If you're a pro user, click on that. It'll let you do Power BI Premium user for 60 days. So these are the individual items. And these are things that are controlled in the Office 365 administration. In that center where you go and you have manager licenses, and this is where you make your purchases, I will be showing you this. Generally, you're going to find someone like an Office 365 global admin. They go to those users in question. They literally flip a switch. It shows you what license you have, and am I going to assign this to this user? That's how this is done for all three of these that you see just here in purple, right? Beyond those individual licenses, and you can see there's some small notes of like what can you can do, personal BI, no sharing or collaboration, pro, that's where you can share and collaborate, premium, basically mimics what's called a P3 dedicated capacity SKU, so Power BI Premium P3. It is an individual license, so it functions a bit differently there, but it unlocks and gives a bunch of different kind of uh, features and capabilities that normally were just behind premium. So you had to, or basically an organization had to basically own and purchase premium to unlock things like you know, uh, full access for the data flow capabilities or the newest data marts features. Well, Power BI Premium per user effectively almost has every aspect of the premium capacity, but the per user option here, um, it's kind of a nice in between there, right? So you can see what it gives you capability of. Now, the reason why I've highlighted Power BI Premium, and you can see Gen 2 is in there, is because as of October of 2021, I want to say that's the, the time frame there, um, Power BI Premium Gen 2 effectively became GA. So if right now you were to go and buy Power BI Premium, you are buying Premium Gen 2. Like That's like the standard now. But of course, people have had Premium prior to that date. So you might still be using Power BI Premium. And basically what would happen is if you go into your actual capacity, there's a little option, I think, near the top. Um, that says, hey, do you want to switch this to Gen 2? So there are some that might be still sitting on maybe a legacy version. I'll call it that for now uh, on Power BI Premium. But as of once again, October 2021, Gen 2 was kind of the standard across the board. Just enhanced performance. You can go and check out in some of the official documentation, but all around just performance gains and additional features, additional metrics and logging. So just pluses all around for anyone who's using premium or dedicated capacity. So 
These are those licensing options. This is controlled at the organizational level. And once again, I kind of highlighted what gets assigned to individuals and then what gets assigned to the, like as an organization, what gets assigned to workspaces. But there's another deeper conversation that comes into play there. So we provided just kind of a layout around like what is accessible. There's really one main thing that I want to kind of focus on in here. There is some pretty important ones. I mean, the free user, we're just going to kind of not really pay attention to that. We're going to focus on everything to the right. Once again, I've left premium capacity here, but primarily this, if you're talking about dedicated capacity within the last year, this is where we're really focused on right here, right? Um, I really want to focus on this so there's a better grip and understanding of what's going on with this item because sometimes there's some misunderstanding on how this is done just we'll cover this one real quick because it does impact a ton um also i mean with more recent news this was a couple of weeks ago i can't remember the exact date uh but we did have it that the they and this happens once in a while um this actually happened with incremental refresh a while ago but most recently a feature that was essentially behind the premium paywall was brought in and now is available for those who are in what's called the shared capacity. Basically, if you don't have premium per user or premium capacity licensing. So if you're just using Pro, you can now take advantage of paginated reports. This was a very recent announcement. You may not have heard about it. Pretty big thing. It's always, a, you know, in the community, anyone who maybe doesn't have premium, whenever they get something new, it's always an exciting thing. So that has a, a very recent change. So this sharing is a critical component to you really truly understand the impact of it. Because obviously, right, if you look at the costs over in the premium capacity, there's a lot going on there for, I mean, $5,000 per month is the lowest skew for a P skew, a premium skew. There's various ones. I have some other kind of criteria on it. But it's all about, well, who can you share with? Because there's actually more value in that 5000 than you might have considered. Right. When it comes to, let's just say, an environment that's only using Power BI Pro, we do not own any premium per user or premium capacity licensing. In this type of scenario, you literally must license any one of your report authors or report administrators, basically anyone who's going to be doing any sort of management or administration in the service. Right. If you're going to be part of a workspace, if you're going to manage a workspace, if you're going to handle refreshing, anything like that, you have to have a pro license but also the individuals in the most traditional way of sharing those objects, all of your read only users also must have a pro license. Yes, there is something like publish to web, but we'll talk about publish to web much later, but publish to web is a non secure way of making reports accessible to the public. Everybody can access this in the world, I can find and get your sensitive data. So it's not something you really want to leverage. In the most traditional ways of sharing your Power BI reports in a secure fashion, everyone will have to have a pro license. That is how it works, right? So let's move that little box over. What if you now have purchased some Power BI per users here, right? Assigned to individuals. Effectively, it follows the same suit. That's why I've labeled it the same yes per user here. Um, but there's another aspect that we haven't talked about and it gets into workspaces. It's all about one, having the right license. So if I'm a premium per user license, what that means is I have access to the features unlocked by premium per user. But the way I leverage those features is by basically either being invited to or creating the appropriate type of workspace. Right. So we'll look at workspaces in the next section. But when you go to create it, literally, there's an option for your workspace type. Is it going to be a pro? Is it going to be a premium per user? Is it going to be a premium capacity or is it going to be an embedded workspace? So basically, if I want to take advantage of some premium per user features, I need to have the license and I need to be going to the right type of workspace. So that's one little aspect of it. What about the people I want to share with? Right. I've got this premium per user workspace. I'm inside of it because I've got a premium per user license and I put a report out there. Right. I put a Power BI report that I'm taking advantage of some feature. Maybe I'm using direct query because I get some better throughput, something of that nature. There's a reason why I'm here. What kind of license do I need to does my end user need to have in order to consume this? Right. Me, Manuel, I'm the report author and admin. I'm in the workspace. I'm going to share my report with Devin. He's a read-only user. He's not going to be invited to the workspace. He just needs to consume this report that I'm hosting from this workspace. What license does Devin need? In this scenario, 
he would need a premium per user license. Sometimes that goes misunderstood. Individuals might consider, oh, they only need to have a pro license in this scenario. No. Once again, look at what I'm focusing on. I'm talking about just premium per user. If that's the situation, anyone accessing content from a premium per user workspace must have a premium per user license. Admins, authors, as well as read-only users. I'm going to take a second here, look over real quick. See a little, uh, I'm going to test this out, Devin, see how it works out here. A little question here. Power Bay Pro license required to consume shared data internally too or no? Um, it depends. If you're talking about effectively using like Power BI data sets to create a new report, you do need to have that type of a license assigned to you. Effectively, anyone accessing information or data from a standard workspace, if you're accessing a data set, which would be how you would consume that internally, you would need to have a pro license there, right? I mean, this is not a means, and I probably shouldn't even mention, obviously, if you have a PBIX file, so you're the report designer developer, you can just share a PBIX with people, but that means they can, I mean, gosh, they literally have the structure of the report. They can disable, turn off visuals, add visuals, modify the data set. It's not a sharing methodology. When anything is inside of the Power BI service, which is our primary means of collaboration and sharing, licensing comes into play. That's where the dollars are spent, right? Because Power BI Desktop is completely free. You can create whatever Power BI reports and models you want. It's all free. It's when we get to sharing and collaboration that cost actually comes into play. So it's pretty neat that it's actually just like everything else is free except for sharing collaboration, right? It's a great way to get people to do some proof of concept elements there. I'm going to check real quick here. What's the minimum license do you need to get page and A reports? I think I accidentally answered that, so that's perfect timing, Arash. Um, it's just recently changed. It is now pro, where it used to be locked behind a paywall. So cool stuff there. Like I said, Devin's keeping an eye on those questions. Once in a while, he'll throw me one quick little guys I can answer. So now, actually, you know, before we go to this one, premium, different. No little asterisk sign. It just says yes to sharing outside your organization. Um, this is unlimited. Premium is known as the true enterprise deployment strategy when it comes to Power BI. Because when you have premium capacity, remember, it's not assigned to an individual. This is actually assigned to a workspace. So now I have a workspace, which you only have to have a pro license. So this is where it gets funky, right? In order, for, this is where things change. For premium capacity, yes, you're paying, let's just, let's just go with what we see on the screen, $5,000 for this capacity, right? You get dedicated CPU and dedicated memory so you can do your operations on demand at, at the moment that you need it. Well, you still have to pay for pro licenses. Individuals who are part of the administration or authoring team for reports, in order to be invited to a workspace, and we'll get into roles later, for the contributor, um, member, or administrator, they still have to have pro licensing. So pro is still in play here, but all of your end users, those who would just simply consume the reports, they can be free Power BI users, no licensing needed. So it really changes it. And this is the case without going too far into this, because this adds another layer of complexity. This goes as well for external B2B scenarios, right? I'm here at Pragmatic Works. I want to share with Devin, who works at Microsoft, let's just say. I could create a Power BI report, share it with Devin Knight at Microsoft.com, and he actually will be invited into my organizational tenant, and I can share it with him. Of course, we're talking about administration. These are features potentially that can be disabled, but B2B functionality is there, but this also impacts licensing, right? Devin has to have a pro license if I'm in a pro environment, right? It's a workspace. It's got a report. I want to share it with him. The rules still apply. He needs to have a license for this. I'm not talking about premium right now. So he either brings one himself, maybe Microsoft gave him one, or I need to provide it for him. This also accents why premium capacity is so well suited for a larger enterprise type of deployment. Because if I have premium capacity and I'm sharing this report with Devin at Microsoft, it doesn't matter what license he has. It's nice, clean, and streamlined. He still needs to be part of my Azure Active Directory for security and all of those purposes, but that's a different story for a different time. And we'll get to that. But true enterprise deployment comes with that dedicated or premium capacity that we're talking about on the right-hand side. So it's really about scope and scale of your organization, right? 
And that's where something like this, right? These little examples that we see here kind of come into play. There is like calculators that you can use within the um, Power BI. Like if you go to the Power BI documentation, they provide you like calculators. You know, how many read-only users do you have? How many authors and administrators do you have? And it'll help break down the cost. But here, there's 1,900 users that need to view, uh, create. so there's read-only users. And then, so this is a large organization, right? And then I have 150 individuals who are going to effectively be developing reports. Those could be more elevated, like BI developers who are creating the data sets and also maybe the report writers who are connecting to those data sets to create the visualizations. But they need to effectively connect to that data that exists inside of a workspace. That's what the 150 are, right? Well, if we were to do pro, all 190 users need to have this. So there's 1,900 plus users. You can see in this case, what we're saying is that the 150 are kind of lumped into that piece, but you have to pay for every single person there. And you can see what the cost is per month, right? This is base list pricing. Obviously there's things like enterprise agreements with changes stuff, but the list price for a pro license is 9.99. So you just do the simple math there. But if you take that scenario and we say, you know, instead of just buying pro licenses, let's just go with premium, which we only need. Let's say we decide even if you were to scale this up and you decided to go with like a SKU that was above this, like maybe it's eight thousand dollars. Right. We went with something above that or even ten thousand. If we went with a ten thousand dollar a month SKU. Right. Um, if you look at the cost, because now we only have to pay for one hundred and fifty pro licenses because that other all those read only users, they're covered by this premium capacity. Even by upping that to $10,000, you're still underneath the pro licensing, right? So once again, it's thinking about who am I trying to reach with this? How large is my audience? And just trying to figure out what is that cost going to really be for me? So like I said, there are calculators available on there. Um, if this is something your organization is like trying to go through right now, deciding, well, what is our licensing strategy? You know, you may start with pro. Maybe you have an enterprise, like an E5 agreement, which comes with pro. You can obviously add premium later. You could add premium per user later. Um, and obviously, you know, in these large organizational decisions like this, getting involved with your Microsoft rep always is a benefit and a good thing because you just want to be licensed in this, right? You don't need to be overpaying, but at the same time, you don't want to be undercutting yourself and potentially not taking advantage of great features. And like, obviously, like in this example, you can actually be overpaying, right? If you're not doing it right because of the number of licenses you actually need. So small things for consideration, little kind of examples. So just remember, we have three types individually assigned. Once we sneak over to the service, I'll kind of showcase where this resides and lives. And then we have the organizational level, which once more, if, you're, if, you've, if you have purchased within the last year or are going to be considering purchasing premium capacity, you're going to be utilizing Gen 2. That's just kind of the standard now. But once again, there is a Gen 1, potentially if you bought it before and you haven't migrated to Gen 2, it's literally a click of a button and it moves it over. You have different model structures that you support. It supports larger data structures. And once again, I think in the marketing of it, they actually pr provide like crazy uh, performance indicators, like 16X performance on like direct query throughput and stuff like that. So Gen 2 was a very large leap in what we could accomplish. And I think also the efficiency of things like incremental refresh got way better. So. It, then that's the, that didn't change the cost of premium capacity. It was four nine ninety five for a P one before. It's still four nine nine five after. So that's just a great addition across the board. So that's licensing. We want to keep that in the back of our head as we have conversations moving forward through the rest of today. What we're going to do is complement that conversation uh, around licensing with workspaces because once again. Even if you have premium capacity purchased or you have premium per user purchased, if you're not utilizing the right type of workspace, you're not taking advantage of those features regardless. So let's talk about those workspaces and see what we got going on here, right? So app workspaces. And if some of you have been paying attention, this isn't super recent. I'm going to say, I wish I could, I should have looked up the exact date. Let's say within the last four to five releases, I might be a little small, uh, like premature on that, but... The screenshot next to us here, which is basically a just quick little screen grab of a workspace, the upper right corner, doesn't, it looks like this, but it's a little different now. This right here, one well more specifically, this right here is grayed out. It still shows up, but there's been some changes. There's been some changes to this process and it's called multiple audiences. If some of you have already seen this feature, you're probably just as excited about it as I am because this really changed the game. And as we talk more about like some of the limitations around kind of 
I, I'm going to use the term limitation here, but when we talk about kind of the specification of how you implement and leverage a workspace, there were some shortcomings, right? That's a nice way of saying limitations. So we're going to get into that. You know, the idea of using the apps within a workspace, I mean, this is kind of the best practice method when you need to share multiple objects across a larger audience, app is the way to go. Now, in the past, I'll just give you a quick little uh, kind of a scenario where this could be problematic was it usually presented itself like you see here. Let's say you had five reports and three dashboards and two Excel workbooks, just arbitrarily picking a number of objects. You would have to decide what's in the app, yes or no. And then you choose who shares that app. Well, what if in this workspace you have group A and they just need access to a couple of those dashboards and reports, not everything. And then group B, they need the same, but more, right? You have two different user needs. The historic way of going about this is you might actually go two routes, create another workspace in which you effectively duplicate those artifacts. And now you share one app with one group and you share this other app with another group. So you're now micromanaging multiple workspaces. Or you would create the app to satisfy the larger group need. Whatever group needs the like larger number of objects, you would go through and you would share it with that individual group. The items that you decided to like exempt from the actual app itself, you would actually have to individually manage those objects. Go to that one report, share it with those users. Go to the second report, share it with those users, right? Those items that were extra that are kind of have a specific user need there. And then now you're micromanaging the reports, right? So not attractive. Well, multiple audiences comes in to save the day here. Whereas you decide what's going to be included in the app or no, just in general, is this going to be, is it ready to be shared? Yes or no? That's the only question you need to answer now. Is this ready to be shared? And then you decide group one, this is what they should see. You can hide. They shouldn't see that. They shouldn't see that. That's for group one. I create another audience. I want them to see this and this and this. And that's another audience. And then we go third, fourth. You could just keep adding audiences. So now we have this kind of granular control within the workspace to share our apps however we see fit, to satisfy this kind of multi kind of group environment where this group A needs one thing, group B needs another, and group C needs a different thing. And now we just have the one workspace that contains all of these artifacts, still making it nice, easy, and clean to kind of manage and maintain it, right? So audiences, it's awesome, it's amazing. You guys, it's it's in play, it's GA. So if you've done anything with apps, you have seen this, you've been made privy to it. So you don't need to like turn it on or anything like that. It's there, it's available. I do believe if you had a historic app already deployed, you would need to actually go through and um, unpublish it and republish it. I think there's a way to kind of migrate those apps. So just in case, if you haven't seen it, know that it is there and it is available. So we're gonna go through this process and actually create some Azure Active, uh, Azure Active Directory. We're gonna go through the uh, process here and actually uh, create a workspace, right? And we're going to, I'm gonna add myself and then we're gonna talk about like the collaborative piece. So just in case for those who are maybe newer to the entire service, um, this is, the, the service is where we're gonna deploy all of our Power BI reports, Page and reports, you know, things such as that. Um, and the workspace is the actual object that actually manages and maintains it. These where the art, artifacts reside and we apply security on top of it. This is where we share with individuals. So we need administration here, right? We need to have a workspace. Um, and here's a small important thing. I don't think I actually have a slide dedicated to this. We're not talking about the My Workspace. That's kind of off limits right now. Um, you effectively should consider the My Workspace as like, I don't even like a demo environment. If you just want to play and have fun, things like this, right? Anything that would be potentially production ready, anything organizationally specific should not be going to the My Workspace. You should be creating an app workspace for this. There's diminished features inside of a My Workspace. You can't invite anyone to it. Not even a global Office 365 administrator can manipulate the stuff that's in that. So if you like put a report there and share it and there's a problem and you're not around to fix it, that's a problem. So stick to your traditional app workspaces, right? We're gonna see, we've got multiple roles we can add into it. Here you can actually leverage things like um, secure, uh, Office 365 security groups, distribution lists, uh, Azure Active Directory security groups, mailing groups, uh, or of course, individual Azure Active Directory users, right? So when you go to invite people, that's where it ties into. So it's tied effectively to Azure Active Directory. Technically, even if you don't go into the Azure space, 
at the initial kind of creation and provisioning of your Power BI tenant, Azure Active Directory is spun up as part of that process. So the basic elements of a workspace, like what is required to create it is literally one thing, a valid workspace name. <laughs> That's all you need. Literally, if you just put in a valid workspace name, you can go ahead and hit save and you're done. But obviously there are more things to consider and look at. And that's what I'm going to be talking about and showing you. A couple of roles, right? We got admin, member, contributor, viewer. Some small thing to, remember I said, keep licensing in the back of your mind. A small thing in addition to our licensing conversation that we were having is that uh, if you are in a premium capacity, right? You Your organization purchased premium. You got a premium workspace. Remember how I said you still have to have pro licenses for your Power BI authors and admins, basically like people are going to be part of a workspace. The viewer role is the exception, right? If you're in Power BI Premium and you want to bring someone into a workspace just as a viewer, they can have a free license there. So that's a kind of a little niche scenario there. But these are your four roles, admin, member, contributor, viewer, and these are kind of in descending as far as what they have. Uh, we won't spend too much time as this is readily available and accessible online, but I have listed out basically their general kind of permissions, what they can accomplish, admin the highest, member underneath that, contributor. This one is the kind of uniqueish one because you can see um, the second bullet there, cannot publish, update, edit app unless granted. So when we go here in a second to create the workspace, you're going to see that there's an option for my workspace saying, hey, in this workspace, do I want to allow contributors to be able to update the app itself. So it is literally a workspace um, per workspace permission that you can set there. And lastly, of course, the viewer role, right? So let me take a quick gander over here. This question, do read only users outside the organization need a Power BI license when organization subscribes to premium? So uh, Sarah there just asking a very specific question around the topic that I was just discussing and the answer is uh, no, they just have to have a free license basically. So they in the only thing that needs to be acquired, if you have premium and you're talking about, uh, here's my premium workspace, I've got this report and I'm gonna share this with person in ABC company, right? Someone outside of my organization. That user, the only requirement there because of B2B, we need to basically be able to show that this user should have access to this report is they simply need to be part of our Azure Active Directory. And as part of that process, you can simply make them and give them a free license. Free licenses obviously don't have limitations. Um, so that's the case. Now, granted, there's a potential as well. Um, there's kind of two scenarios in that example that Sarah's talking about is that you can provide that free trial, you can basically, they're going to have to be in your AAD and you can literally just flip the switch and you're going to see that when we get to the admin side, it just says Power BI free. Is it yes or no? You just turn it on. Um, or if that's been done for them within their home organization, then that's already taken care of, right? But no actual paid licensing is required for internal or external customers for reading content from a Power BI premium workspace. Hopefully that uh, answers that question. Um, it depends on this question here. Um, I'll probably go like two questions every once in a while. For Steven, viewer role can be a free user. Situationally, right? The only scenario where a viewer can go into an app workspace with a free license is if that is a Power BI premium workspace. It's the only way. Anything else in any other scenario, anybody, viewer, member, contributor, they must have a pro license. It's only in Power BI capacity scenarios that you can invite someone to a workspace as a viewer and they do not have to have a paid license. So hopefully that makes sense. All right, I'm gonna sneak away from the PowerPoint just for a moment, guys. Um, once again, don't forget, this is more of a watch and learn as we're going through it. You can see just right now, I'm inside of my Power BI tenant. This is me, Manuel, pragmaticworks.com. So you won't see any of this because this is, this is my show, right? So over here, we're going to go over and check this out um, and bring this up. First and foremost, upper right corner, this is your user account. This is where you can see the type of license you have. If you have the ability of starting a trial, you could do it right here. It shows up in yellow. I'm actually currently doing a trial for premium per user. So I technically have access to those features for another 50 days. There's not necessarily, I'm thinking off the top of my head, anything that's 
well, there's probably some scenarios, yeah, that I'm going to use that do require it. But once again, this is more of a watch and observe type of scenario. So let's create, I'm going to create a workspace that I'm going to end up utilizing for this class itself. So I'm going to go ahead and go to my workspaces, right? Over here on the left-hand side is where we're going to head off to. Um, once again, we haven't gotten to things like the admin portal or tenant settings, but it should be noted at minimum, in order to create a workspace, you have to have at least a pro license. So naturally, if you're a pro, premium per user, um, which are the only two things that can be assigned to you from a paid perspective, either of those two, if you have it, you can create a workspace as long as the organization allows for it. So even if you see this and you can hit create workspace, there's a chance it'll tell you that this feature has been disabled. That's a very common practice where organizations simply want to limit the creation of workspaces. There's no actual cost to a workspace. So there was a time when it was the wild, wild west out there for workspaces and people were just creating them left and right. This resulted in just a ton of redundant artifacts all over the place, redundant refresh schedules, redundant reports. It became somewhat of a nightmare. Uh, oddly enough, when Power BI was first coming out in the service, there was no way to limit who, if you, if someone had a pro license, they could create however many workspaces they wanted, right? So it was pretty crazy there, but it's pretty standard now for organizations to go through the process and limit who can create it. So even if you have a pro or premium per user license, you still might not be able to do this, but that's a good thing. Workspace name. I'm just going to go here, learn with the nerds, PBI admin, right? And it tells me, is this available? Yes or no. And technically I'm done. That's all I need to do. Of course, you can go in here and you can upload a potential image if you wanted to. There are some limitations on the size that you can use for this. Um, you can add a little description if you also prefer. This will take you to the official documentation walking you through what's going on down here below. But since I'm with you, why don't I just go through that? Contact lists. Basically, if someone wants to join a workspace, because you can make these discoverable, um, it'll say, you know, uh, request access. Also, if someone gets hold of a link to a Power BI report and they haven't been granted access, who is going to be on my contact list? So by default, it's the workspace admin. And right now it would just be me, right? I'm creating this initially. I will be the only person as part of it right now. And I will be the admin. So if someone wants to reach out and get, ask for access for a report, it's me who's going to get that notification and that email. But of course you can say, well, you know what, let's go to so-and-so, right? And literally this is tied to Azure Active Directory. So if I want Devin to be my contact, there he is. I can literally just add him, right? If I want uh, all of my trainers, right? We've got a distribution list and as well a Microsoft security group for what's called our trainers, right? If I go right here, I have two actually. Um, the trainers one, I think is the one we use primarily, but if I did this, I'd have myself, Devin, Mitchell, Alice. I mean, you name it, all the trainers we have, they're part of that group. So you can choose how you want to go through this process. I'm going to leave mine to uh, just use my workspace admins, but you got control here. Workspaces. There's kind of a two-part aspect of this. This basically would set it up so that if you have a SharePoint, a, a shared SharePoint library that you've created, so you'd have to have that in place already. And generally, the easiest way to do this is you create a group. We're not going to go too far into that. I will show you the areas where you can create groups so you can see what I'm discussing and talking about. Quite often, you'll create a group and add the users to that group itself, right? And then what you do is you give that group access to the shared SharePoint library, and then you use that group here. So for me, I think I have one here for my trainers as well. Actually, let me see here. Did I? I did create one here, right? So I created this security group right now that had access. I think I just added myself and a couple of others, but I say, hey, this group, whatever SharePoint library that's been associated with it, that's what I want to make available within this. So when you basically go through the process of hitting get data and you hit the files option, which we'll see later, the option will present itself for, hey, you have this shared library. You want to go check it out? So I'll just leave that there for now um, and we'll check that out later. And here's a pretty important piece that sometimes gets messed up and left behind, the license mode. I am a premium per user. You can see I'm using the trial, but notice by default, this is was about to create a pro workspace. So if I wanted to take advantage of some of these premium per user features, guess what? I just made a little bit of a mistake there. I no longer can 
take advantage of those premium user features because this is not the right workspace. Now, the beautiful thing is this isn't a uh, you know nail in the coffin type of mistake here. If it, I accidentally were to hit save and then I realize, uh oh, that's a pro workspace, you can change this after the fact. So actually, you know what I'll do is I'm actually going to leave this as a pro and I'll just show you how to make that adjustment after the fact. Uh, if you want to use this as a preview feature for choosing um, a specific Azure Data Lake Gen 2 storage, actually, this doesn't let you pick the ADLS storage. It actually saves it to the uh, account that's been defined at the organizational level. But it's just a place where you can store the data and information around the data flows. Uh, develop a template. It's kind of unique. Definitely check out the Learn More. If you've ever gone and hit the Apps button and looked at the publicly available apps, that is the process you can do to effectively publish your own app. So that is a publicly facing item, um, making it, sometimes people use it so they can make it easy so they can share something with a client. And effectively those templates force the users to basically add in their own connection strings and stuff like that. But you can curate and kind of set up the structure of dashboards or reports, stuff like that. And here is that workspace specific permission. Should I, within this workspace, if I assign someone the contributor role, should they be allowed to update the app? I have to make that choice right here. So let's just assume that this is the workspace we're going to go with. I'm going to go ahead and hit OK. We've already talked about how there's a small issue here and the fact that uh, I haven't gone ahead and it's not a premium. Let's say I knew I wanted to take advantage of premium features. It is not premium per user, right? There's two ways you can identify this. One is the icons. One second here. Kind of lost my screen share. Um, Put it still there is the icon that potentially would appear right here and it will show up momentarily because we're going to update this a diamond with a little silhouette of a person power bi premium per user a diamond on its own premium capacity nothing pro so that is the design and the layout that we have for choices so let's swing let's get our little diamond with a person on this right what i need to do is simply go into the uh, settings of my workspace so you can see it's just there at the top and you can see this is where it was before, right? Admin, it's gone. It's okay. They snuck it over here to this little premium side here. So all I need to do is say, and this will only ever show you what basically the highest level that you can create. This account has premium per user, but this organizational tenant, so the pragmatic work tenant, does not have premium capacity. So it's not going to allow me to make something that wouldn't work. So I could switch this over to premium per user. Because now I'm switching over to premium producer, I get some additional choices. Are we going to use the small data set or the newer large data set format? And um, this workspace connection, if you're unaware, is something you can use actually to connect with something like SQL Server Management Studios and actually query the data sets that exist inside of this. So there's some kind of fun stuff you can do there with that endpoint. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and save this, which is going to effectively change this to premium per capacity. And it was telling me there in the warning messages, hey, you're turning this to premium per user. Only other people with PPU licenses can join this. So how do I invite people, right? And the thing is, there isn't a degree of control here. And what I mean is, let's say I wanted to invite Devin just now. I think right now Devin has got a pro license, only he's been kind of manipulating it. But you'll notice it doesn't prevent me from inviting him as, in this case, a member, but once again, I can choose what access he will be. And once again, in the slide deck, you've got the granular breakdown of it. But he does not have a premium per user license. So if he was to log into the Power BI portal, he'll see this work. He'll see Learn with the Nerds Power BI admin now. When he tries to access this, he will get some indication and messages around not having the appropriate level of licensing in order to leverage or take advantage of what's in here. So that's a little interesting that they don't kind of indicate anything here. Um, we could also go through the process of once again, adding one of these types of either distribution lists or security groups. But once again, it's simply just adding this into the mix here. There's still the question of, well, do they have the right assigned licenses? And because I'm using premium per user, it's a little specific there. So let's not forget what that process looks like. But right there, I've got this set here. We've got the... Uh, options for our workspace. I've got that set. Um, as far as like security groups and everything, once again, that is handled just here. I am in the, as you can see, the uh, Microsoft 365 admin center. So once again, you got to have the right permissions or you're not going to see these relevant values here on the left-hand side, but you can go in here and look at individual users. 
So the thing I want to show here real quick is how do you assign a license? This is where you go to assign a license. You can also do certain things within the Azure portal as well, but I'm going here through the admin center and I can look, I can look for individuals. And technically also you can go down into uh, like our kind of billing section. You can also go down into the areas where you can purchase licenses. So there are some things you can go into here to check out, well, how many licenses do I have? You can check that out. Uh, do you want to purchase? If I wanted to buy premium, per uh, like premium P3 capacity, this is literally where I go. So I'll show you that in a moment, but this is literally me looking. These are all the people right now that are inside of Pragmatic Works Azure Active Directory. And I could go over and find our good friend Devin here and say, here it is. I want to be using this one. This is his um, internal email address. This is his uh, domain specific account here. You can see he has some external accounts. He also is inside of it, uh, but you can see I can make some adjustments, some amendments, but what we're focused on right here is licenses. So if I go down and take a look, these are all the available licenses that we have available. Notice there's some that haven't been assigned here. And if I keep going down, I can see there's Power BI free, unlimited. This is gonna be available across the board for any organization. So if I wanted to, this is how you would sign a free license. But Devin is consuming one of our 101 Power BI Pro licenses. Um, you can see the uh, Power BI premium per user. Um, we do not have one to assign for it, uh, but like I said, there's the opportunity to do some trials on there, uh, but this is how you go about doing this. And as you can see, technically there's stuff for power apps, for virtual agents. So even though we're talking about power BI, this is licensing across the board. So that's pretty cool that we have it right there in kind of a one-stop shop there. Let me take a quick gander here. Can I restrict a pro license user from publishing to web? Uh, you can, what I'll do is I'm going to wait till later on till we get to the tenant settings. So a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be discussing here that's in the portal, that's like, oh, you know what? You might be able to do this. You might not. It can be controlled in the tenant. Um, when I make little like notices uh, such as, oh, published web, that could be a very bad thing. The admin portal and the tenant settings is robust. It's almost getting to a point that there's too much going on in there. They have categorized it. Um, you can use a control F to move through it, but there is so many things that you can flip the switches on or off in here. It's crazy. And one of those things is publish to web. So you can say, hey, I don't want this feature to be on at all. And to be honest, that's actually now the default selection. So if you don't have Power BI in your organization, said, we're going to get Power BI and you launch it, publish to web will be uh, disable for the organization as it should be. Um, I think the workspace creation by default is enabled, but it might be turned off and we will look at tenant settings later, but the answer is yes, you can specify if you want specific people only to be able to publish to web or just turn it off as a whole, right? So that's definitely a pretty important setting there. So the tenant settings are pretty darn critical. So the admin center, licensing, that's where it handles it. This is also where we can go through and look at groups, right? We mentioned that little trainers group. Let me let this load up here. You can see a, uh, Microsoft 365 groups, distribution list, uh, security groups right here on the right. So it's taking its uh, sweet time loading here. Give it a moment. Let's see if I switch tabs or something. Oh, there we go. Took its sweet time. But if we go, we're looking for our trainers, right? It was trainers. Well, it was trainers and trainers one. So we have there's trainers one just right here. So that is the this is a 365 group that we have. If we go over to the distribution list, I believe this is where we'll find both of them. Trainers and training. You remember? So trainers one. Uh, this one right here is a distribution list, while the other one is actually a 365. There's different impacts across the Office 365. You can actually create groups here too. So this is where it kind of helps you. Hey, 365, this is a group email. You can see where it impacts you, distribution. It's just email addresses for a group of people. You can see it just lets you know how to do it. And literally you just walk through this, create a group name, you assign who the owner is gonna be, who are the members that are gonna be part of it. This is traditionally, and once again, you have to have pretty elevated permissions for this because this is going to impact your overall organization. But this is usually going to be the very common way to really help manage 
who's in a workspace, how, who do we want to share reports with? Remember we talked about an app, how it's great for sharing and distributing lots of objects with a ton of people? Well, you don't want to type in all those people's names, right? Instead, you can type in trainers. You can type in sales group West, sales group East, whoever it might be. The management of who's part of those groups occurs here. And this is going to be the best for organization because if I'm in a group, this let's just kind of sneak peek at something later on, right? Row level security, right? And I assign this row level security so that this group in the Southwest can only see stuff for the Southwest. And I'm part of that group. Well, I switch to the Southeast team. If this occurs, and now I should be part of a different role of, because there's already a role level security set up for Southwest East, but I wasn't West. As long as this is being managed and me as a user is being moved from the Southwest group over to the Southeast, everything just trickles down. Right. And now the role level security is in play. Whatever I should be seeing is in play. It's a beautiful thing. If maybe we're managing access to workspaces via groups like this, now the workspace list that I have access to updates and changes. Right. Instead of having to manage this on all these different potential places, if we up kind of and generally IT, there'll usually be an IT group responsible for keeping these groups up to date. As long as this is the method that's being used, it can make your process inside of um, just managing and working through Power BI just so much more consolidated. So definitely, this is a big key area. A lot of times organizations, if this isn't something that you have access to and capabilities, quite often there'll be some sort of usually request form. So you can say, hey, this group doesn't exist for this group that I need for this purpose. Can you create it for me? Uh, or we need to make an update or add someone to a specific group. It just makes the process that much more streamlined. Uh, but you can see how sometimes there's going to be a bit of a distribution in responsibility because we're now in the we're away from the Power BI portal. Now we're in the Admin 365 uh, Center. So there's even more, right? We haven't even gone to the Compliance Center yet. So this is definitely a great, fantastic way of doing it. Yes, you will always have the ability of adding individual names to workspaces, how to share, adding them to apps, role level security, whatever it is. But man, that could be super cumbersome um, in the long run. So groups, groups, groups. It's going to be a fantastic way of going about this. And probably for now, the last thing I'm going to look at is, once again, if you have the right access and permissions, this is it. Literally, what do you want to purchase? I'm going to go real quick. And don't worry, Devin's probably sweating in the background. I won't buy us a little P3 node right quick. But literally, you can go through this process and say, I'm looking and interested in doing something with Power BI. This is the process. If the decision's made, your organization is going to uh, purchase premium capacity, this is where you go. Under the Power BI category, I could buy a premium P2, P1, P3. The four and five SKUs, generally, you'll have to call for that. They're only available in specific regions. I have some kind of uh, information on that. Um, premium per user, there it is. If you want to buy some pro license, literally, you just click on the details. You specify how many you'd like to purchase. And now this is part of your organization. It literally will. If Right now, we have 101 Power BI Pro licenses. If I clicked on this and I bought 50 more, I've got 151, right? It's literally just going to add it to the number. It's really this straightforward to potentially spend $10,000 per month. So that's why it's locked behind specific access. And literally, this is where you spend the money. So definitely got to be a little cautious there on how we're going about that. Let me check here. Small little question. If you switch back from PPU to pro user, do you get charged for pro cost of $10 a month? So it so here's the trick. You are licensing is what determines your cost. If I have 10 premium per user licenses and then all of a sudden I and that's, you know, $20 per license, uh, 200 bucks is what you're paying there. I'm doing nice clean round numbers here. And then you switch to having five premium per user licenses and five pro, then Actually, I did 10, 10, 10. Yeah, you do that math. It will switch up. These five tens, so 50 bucks over here, and five twenties over here, 100. So that's how it's going to break apart. It will be charged monthly based off of whatever actual licenses. I mean, you can go here. If you can do the math yourself, you can go to your licenses and say, how many licenses do I have here? And you can see, this is me looking. I have 69 available licenses, but here is 101. So 999 times 101, that's going to be that cost. If I have, you notice there's only one premium per user in our organization and it's being consumed. So we're only paying for one. So if you do make that type of migration, which you can do, that's with the help of, uh, I think you have to do that with Microsoft to do that. What happens is those premium per user workspace 
those artifacts will remain. They will exist. But naturally, you can't consume anything from there. You can't take advantage of the features. Effectively, you would need to do like I showed and say, okay, we know our organization decided to get rid of premium per user. So what I need to do is go back into these settings if I want to keep these objects that are in here. Otherwise, they're useless in here, right? I would go and switch this back to a pro mode. And then I'll be in a pro license mode. So you definitely have to, uh, you, you only get charged for what you actually have licensed within that tenant here. So you can always have, the transparency is here. You can always see what you've got and you'll know exactly what you're going to be charged. Now I'm using some nice even numbers here, right? $20 for premium per user, but you may have some sort of enterprise agreement or something like that, which changes it, but it's always gonna be whatever you have agreed upon, multiplied by whatever the number is here, right? That's how it works. So hopefully that answers that question for you. All right, so we looked at how to assign a license. We got our workspace up and going here. The only other thing I wanna do as part of this little lesson was, um, I'm gonna end up deploying something here. Uh, I'll do that in a moment, but because I, I just have a couple little items we wanna discuss in regards to it. Um, and that is for app workspaces, right? Um, once again, the container in which we deploy Power BI reports, we upload Excel workbooks, potentially you can create a copy of it, or you can connect to something that exists within a SharePoint or OneDrive library. This is where your data marts go. This is where your data flows go, right? This contains everything. That's why right here, you've got all of this little organization, right? It showcases what potentially could exist. Now, this is a fresh, brand new one, so we got nothing in there. We do have the capability of downloading PBX files. Um, once again, if you've been keeping track of the newest in the November release, which was two days ago, they released the November release, so just FYI. And if you launch November, you might be like, whoa, because they changed the accent color to teal. It's always a big thing. But they have made adjustments to this line right here, actually, downloading PBX files. Once again, downloading PBX files, obviously, we talked about how that's really not a way you should share this. Um, so naturally, not everybody should be able to download PBX files. This is going to be reserved for individuals who are contributor or higher inside of a workspace. That's why hopefully this makes more sense. The workspace, and there's some, I know there's a little caveat here because there's a viewer role, but stay with me. Let's just forget about viewer for a second. Let's focus on contributor and above. These should only be assigned to actual individuals who are report authors, admins, people who should have access to the underlying report. People, just think about it, that you should allow to be able to download the PBX. If a person gets their hand on a PBX, kiss goodbye to your role level security, kiss goodbye to your nice, beautiful model. They have the actual model itself. They can do whatever they want. This is what we do as report writers. We manage, we kind of control that. We have the PBX file and we deploy it to the service and that's where it remains. That's how it stays secured. So downloading a PBX is gonna be limited to those who have access within a workspace. All too often, I see organizations inviting read-only users into workspaces. Now you can do viewer role, but I just don't think this is a very good organic experience for a user. If, the, if you're not sharing apps or maybe if you only have a couple of reports and you decide you want to share individual reports, if your method is to have your users go to the portal, find the workspace in question, open up the artifact in question, and then they start navigating versus they can just click on a link that you've provided to them super clean and easy and be done with it or create a subscription, it's a very different user experience here. I don't think your read-only user should have to be knowledgeable or trained on what workspaces are and how do I navigate them. All they want to know is how do I get to the report that I can filter and work with? So yes, there's a viewer role. Yes, you can bring them in there. But I always preach, and the best practice is, that workspaces, you should only invite fellow collaborators in here. You want to share? That's what the app is for. That's what the share button is for the individual objects. So downloading reserved for only users within the workspace. And there's now two options. You can, as you could traditionally, Download the actual PBX, which it literally downloads into your downloads folder. And there you go. You have access to it. Or you can actually download a PBX, which just has a live connection to the Power BI data set in question that you're talking about, that you're looking at. Um, this second feature is actually very beneficial in very unique scenarios where downloading a PBX historically was not available to us. So, for an example, if you have a Power BI report and you have implemented um incremental refreshing, you cannot download that PBIX. There's way more additional things going on with that actual tabular model that it won't be represented inside a Power BI desktop. So you can't, it's literally grayed out. 
But if you still actually want to make a connection to this and work with it in Power BI Desktop, now you have the choice of downloading a PBX with a live connection to the data set. You'll see that uh, in a moment when I upload a file, I'll show that to you. Saving PBX files as a template. We talked about that. That's just an option that's available to you. Um, and then, of course, once again, the discovery. We already discussed as well how users, if they find that workspace, how they can request access to it. Um, that's just additional options that you can do. So all I'm going to do here is uh, I'm going to publish something to the Power BI workspace. Two ways to go about it, right? You can either open up Power BI Desktop, which this might open up on my other screen here. But if it doesn't, you'll see the, woo, the green. Oh, it's kind of in the middle, which is weird. But here's the new green. Crazy, right? Um, just uh, better contrast. Um, it's still the classic yellow and black logo, so it hasn't gone away. Uh, but what I'm going to do is, and once again, you don't need to follow along with me necessarily because um, I'm not really going at that type of a pace. But I'm simply just opening up a report. I picked a very generic one. It's the same one you would use in a dashboard in a day because this is one way that we can publish, right? So I can go over here, click publish. I get presented a list of workspaces that I have access to. So any workspace in which I have been granted contributor or higher roles will show up here. Of course, I'm interested in the Learn with the Nerds one, Power BI Admin. So I'm going to select it, and it will be published out here. The only thing, reason why I'm doing it from here is to showcase something very specific. If you are unawares, is when you are developing a Power BI report, it's a file, a PBIX file. That's it, one file, one extension. When we deploy this out to the service, what this is going to produce is it effectively separates it into the two objects that we will be working with, a report which is the more graphical represent, it's the visuals, right? This is the actual report pages and the interaction. And then we also get the data set itself. So it actually splits into two pieces because we potentially, depending on how your organization maybe adopts or incorporates Power BI, you can create the visualization. So the, the visual portion of Power BI reports right from here. Literally, you can go in and say, I wanna make a brand new report. And this is, the designer, you can see it's the same thing. It's almost like deja vu. Check it out. If I kind of do an alt tab, it looks pretty darn close, doesn't it? Right. So there are some nuances, obviously, that aren't available to us within here, like the modeling components of it. But the visual piece you can do here. So this does allow you literally to create a new report based off of that data set. And this is what there was a question earlier. Hey, do we have to give pro licenses to users internally who want to consume the data? So let's say maybe I do like Power BI Desktop and I might need to do some enrichment and enhancement in the modeling side of stuff. Well, I can't do that. Historically, there's some caveats to my commentary. Now I'm going to put some disclaimers because of this guy. We're not really going to go into it because it's freebie, but it's exciting. Uh, but I can actually see this now in the Power BI desktop, right? This data set exists out there. Now, obviously, I see it, right? Because I'm the admin and the author of it. Let me find this right quick. Dyad final report. Oh, it's actually right here at the top. I literally could create a report off of this data. This allows me to make that connection. So that's why there's kind of this separation because I might have in, an individual who doesn't care about the actual report that I created, right? The bar charts, the line charts, the slicers. If they want to create their own variation, maybe take this data and augment it with something else. So I don't need to share this report with them. What they want is access to this. And that's, of course, where there is more in the realm of secu security is not what we're talking about. That's something else entirely. But inside of the permissions, right? This is where you can go. Uh, Devin is an admin. Remember, I added him in, so he's good to go. This is where you can say, hey, you know what? I have someone that doesn't really care about the actual report itself, right? He doesn't care about the visuals. He just wants to connect to this data set from Excel, from Power BI. This is where you can go in and say, you know what? This is uh, Mitchell. You know, he, he should have access to this. Um, and then you decide. Do I want this individual to be able to modify the data set? Do I want them to be able to share it? Do I want them to build content? Very straightforward, and you just specify exactly what you want them to have, and you can see it right here. Mitchell has read and build access at the data set level. Now, technically, if I go over here, you can see he doesn't have access to the report. There's a very granular element here when it comes to sharing here, so it's definitely something to maybe take, you know, take your time and realize it really is segmented here. You can do stuff with the data set, or you can do it with something with the report. A lot of times the hierarchy here, though, is workspace, artifact, well, report, 
and then data set. And then you could say report slash dashboard. Because if I give access to someone at the workspace level, that gives access to the reports and the data set. So it kind of trickles down. If I give access to someone at the report or dashboard level, I'm giving them access to the underlying data set. And then at the very lowest level is the data set itself. So hopefully that makes sense in kind of the, the hierarchy of things. Now, even though this is not a requirement anymore, I do have a small little guy that I was going to upload here just to show a small difference. And that is going to be, as I go through my downloaded resources here, um, I just threw it in here, you know, just as an extra thing. Um, it's a paginated report. So you can see there's a visual indication and difference, but there is no associated data set when it comes to that, as there's a whole different kind of reporting structure here. You still kind of manage it in the same way. You use Azure After Directory to grant users access, but paginated reports never actually, they don't have an underlying model and any sort of metadata or data storage structure. It is literally basically just, you can almost equate it to direct queries, but paginated reports, check out our paginated reports in a day stuff because we have a ton of stuff on that. Um, and if you wanted to, just so I can saturate this workspace a little bit more, uh, I'm actually going to go down in the bottom left-hand corner here and hit get data. And I'm going to just bring in, um, there's a section here in get data where you can get some samples. And I'm going to bring in just customer profitability. Because I want to add a little bit more to the mix. Since we've been talking about um, the apps, right? We talked about the app, multiple audiences. That's something we're going to manipulate here in a moment. So I want to add more to the mix so I can showcase this. So this brings in, as you can see now, if we switch over to content, this produces, and actually I'm going to refresh this real quick because sometimes it takes a moment for the dashboard to show up. But if I go to content, now I have one dashboard, two, two Power BI interactive reports, one page in a report, and there's a workbook. And of course, you can go to the underlying data sets in here. There's only two. So this is once again to showcase there's separation, right? We have one data set. This data set, if you want, you can also, this is a pretty cool thing. If you haven't gone in, you can view the lineage. So on this data set, you can see it's right here. This is basically responsible for customer profitability, this report and the dashboard. Uh, over here, I missed it for a second. Um, there's some other objects in here for the admin, but you can view the lineage for anything in here. This one is only going to go to one report. So this one's probably a little bit uh, boring, but you can see the source system in here because this is not a sample. So this is something uh, that we'd have to manipulate because it's it's an on-prem resource. So I would actually need to establish something with the data gateway. That's coming up in a little bit. But we got some fun stuff in here. We got a premium per user workspace. I've got, I added Devit into the mix. We looked at and talked about how you could potentially switch how this is actually being leveraged. So like if we needed to go back, almost like revert ourselves and go back to pro, how could we do it? We got to see that option. Can on-prem be migrated to premium cloud? So I'm assuming Fox here is asking the question of, um, which is something we're not going to focus too much on. There's kind of a different aspect of Power BI administration, and that would be Power BI on-prem. Power BI, it's called report server administration. So I'll do a quick little bit on it, but we don't have much to kind of complement this. But the on-prem option is effectively a super set of features for the SSRS report server. So it's not touching the cloud. It's all on-prem. Um, unfortunately, there's no like true migration process. The interesting piece here, though, is like on-prem allows you to actually connect to data sets that exist out there. But if you actually needed to move objects that exist in your on-prem report server out to, let's say, because once again, it's different. It's a folder structure type of scenario in the on-prem versus workspaces. I know in theory, it seems like they operate the same, but it's not. So there's no like way to say, oh, you know what? This directory needs to be mapped to this workspace and just move everything I have over there. Also, there's a different underlying set of features technically. That's why there's two different versions of Power BI Desktop. There's Power BI Desktop optimized for the cloud and there's one that's optimized for report server. So unfortunately, there's no really organic or built-in migration. It's really a factor of saying, okay, here's my reports and I'm gonna publish this out to the workspace. And sometimes you actually wanna go in and look at those reports because you might wanna augment them because the cloud version of the desktop tool is gonna have way more features. They're usually around seven to nine months in discrepancy as far as features goes. And you guys know how fast Power BI updates, seven to nine months behind, that's a lot of features. So um, unfortunately, yeah, no organic way to just say, I'm using on-prem, let's just 
click a button and pass it up there. There's more that has to come into play because you really need to evaluate, do I need to take advantage of everything? There's not even, the dashboards aren't even a thing in on-prem, right? So you got to consider that in the service. So it's more of a manual operation. I have seen some individuals use like programmatic methods using things like PowerShell and using um, some sort of commands so you can push stuff through the XMLA endpoints and stuff like that. But that gets a little bit crazier and it's definitely a bit farther beyond the scope and lens of what's here. Um, but, you know, interesting question, but I don't think there's a great answer for that, unfortunately. Um, yeah, it's just the way that goes. So... Let me go ahead since we now have a good amount of objects in this workspace and just have a small conversation around apps. And then we will take our break here shortly. I'm keeping an eye on the time, but we talked about apps, right? Best practice way of sharing a larger uh, set of objects with people. But now we have the granularity of doing this with our multiple audiences, right? Multiple audiences, we can go through this process. As of right now, there was always a question before multiple audiences come in. You can only have one app per workspace. So because of that kind of limitation we were talking about, where if you have multiple sharing considerations, people are like, oh, maybe they'll add in the ability of having multiple apps. That didn't change. What changed was how we define who gets shared with inside of the app itself. So I foresee it continuing to be one app to one workspace. So I don't think that's going to be changing, especially with what we have with multiple audience. I don't really see anything else that's needed here. This is really what we've been waiting for with no exaggeration for years, right? Apps have been around for a while. I've been waiting for this for a long time. So it was awesome when it came around. Um, and this can be shared once again, either internally, externally, you make your choices, uh, but it is the app. So right before we go on our break, let's dive in and let's take a gander at um, apps, right? Once again, only available if you actually have an app workspace. If you notice, if I go over to my workspace, this is also a reason why I say, no, no, there is no app option. So no, no to the My Workspace, right? If you're taking some of our on-demand learning classes, that's a perfect scenario where you can use it. All right, got some good objects in here. Remember the screenshot. Included an app is still here, but it's all grayed out. You cannot toggle this anymore. That was how you used to manage it. Now it's all gonna be done through the create an app experience. So build our app. Step one, what's the name of it? If you do want to separate by default, it automatically just gives the app the name of the workspace. If you want to differentiate it, you can. Maybe just throw a little something in there. Enjoy this awesome app. And then of course, if you want a different logo, it takes the workspace logo by default, you can. And whatever theme color you want to go with. In memory and uh, honor of the November release, I'm going to do that little green theme as well. Well, there's this teal. I'll get as close as I can here. And then who is the contact? This is very similar to what we did with the workspace where it said, who do you want the contact? It's going to be my admins or I could have made a list. This is basically saying, okay, so if someone gets access to the link for this app, but they don't have access to it, right? Um, who do I want them to be able to contact and reach out? So by default, it's set to whoever I'm publishing. So right now it'll be me if I do this. Um, if I want it to be the list of people that I specified when I did the workspace, that's number two or I can say whoever I want, right? So I'm gonna leave it to this, which will show up as my name. And what about other settings, right? I know it's kind of funky for this to sound like it, but it has this install this app automatically. I actually find this extremely useful. Um, you might not do this by default as once again, if you have tons of apps and maybe this is something you're sharing organizationally, like with everybody, Maybe you want to leave it for them to make that choice and decision, but users need to be aware of how to do it. So what I'm going to do is not install the app automatically so that I can walk you through what installing an app actually is. But once again, once you see and understand it, clicking this can be a very convenient thing. If you know, hey, here's the audience this, that needs this app and they all will need it, install this app. Uh, hide the navigation is just a choice. Basically, it determines what is going to be the default experience when a user opens his app. Do you want the navigation pane, which is on the left-hand side, to be expanded or collapsed to start? Once they're in the app, they can collapse or expand it themselves. So just a choice. And should users be able to make copies of these reports? Um, just a choice. You have to decide what you're going to do. Maybe you have an additional, like a SharePoint site or some sort of other custom site that you've added, like additional maybe instructions or documentation around this app to kind of just accent it and kind of, you know, just uh, basically complement it. You can put that URL down here. 
The next piece is where this changes. This is pretty much the same as it was before, but the next section is where things change. Before you had to hit the toggle. Is it in the app? Yes or no? Here, you have a list of all of your objects. Notice data sets don't show up because if you're gonna choose a report or a dashboard, the data set that it's being powered by is automatically gonna be added, right? So you choose and let's say, you know what? Let's say everything in here is ready. And the question that gets asked right here is what's ready to be deployed? What's good to go? That's it. Not who yet, just what's ready to be shared with. And let's assume everything but the dashboard. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave out my paginated report and I'm going to include the dashboard. So the paginated is something I'm still working on. So it's not ready to be shared yet. So I say add. This literally is going to change that little toggle and it will show up there. But then you can add more. Maybe you want to add some organization. So I can add a section. Think of it like a folder. And I can say like, okay, here is my dashboard. And that is this guy right here. So I'm going to drag it and drop it right inside. So it's you can see it's going to be like a little folder. Actually, that's my workbook. So I don't want that to be there. My dashboard is this one. Yes. So I'm going to drop that in the dashboard. This is why it can also be helpful to do this. I'm going to create another section for my actual Power BI report because I know eventually I'm going to have some paginated reports. So I might want to separate those. There's this report. And uh, I want this guy right here. And you can choose the order. The important thing to note is whatever is at the top. So the top section and the top artifact. So in this case, Power BI reports is at the top and the dyad final report within it is the top object. That is where users by default will that's where they're going to be landing when they go into this app. So this does matter for other reasons too. So definitely move things up or down as you see fit. This bottom one is an Excel workbook. So I'm just going to add another section for that and just call this workbooks and just drag that in there. And I'm not, I don't want them to go to the workbook first. So I'm just going to drag that down. And if you wanted to, you could like add a link, let's say here, uh, pragmatic works. ODL, and I'll just grab this URL real quick and put this. Do I want to open it in the current tab? Yeah, why not? And I'm not going to put it into any section, but now this is literally going to be a URL that's available and you'll see how this shows up. So this is a little bit of a different experience. Here's where it's brand, brand new. Who am I sharing this with? And it shows you how this is going to start off, right? This starts off in the final report in market share. So it just launched as it would. What do I need? Let's assume that this is going to be, you can see it takes on the default name here. I'm going to call this, this is the app. I'm going to go ahead and share this with Devin, let's just say, right? So Devin is going to have access to everything. You can decide also, once again, remember this adjustment we saw before, you can make changes here if you'd like. But Devin is going to be the individual who has access to this. And notice by default, workspace user. So without me putting in here, Devin's technically already a workspace user. Um, so he'll be, this would technically overwrite it because he has access to everything. But we'll just think about it. Let's just say also, I just add like Matt or something in there. These individuals are going to see everything. So I said, okay. I also want to set this up for Mitchell, but Mitchell doesn't really care. what He doesn't really need to see the workbook. He doesn't really care about that. Um, so I'm just going to eliminate that. And I can say, you know, here's my, you know, you can, audiences don't really see this name. So you can really put it whatever you want. No workbook view or something like that. And that's going to go straight to Mitchell. And you can see, I can keep adding, right? Maybe I should only want to share my dashboards with someone or whatever it might be. You keep adding your audiences. You keep specifying who it's going to be shared with. And now you don't really have a scenario where your, your very granular sharing scenarios cause you a problem. It's ready to go. So then you just publish this app. It says it takes five to 10 minutes, depends on really how many objects you have. And here is this link. So the interesting part is, as I described it, you can basically share this link anywhere, right? When a user clicks on this, that's when we determine, do they have access to this? So right now, Mitchell will have access to his view. Devin and Matt will have access to their view. And obviously anyone within the workspace, this link will work for. If anyone else somehow, let's just say you throw this in Microsoft Teams, anyone who clicks on that link in Microsoft Teams will be taken to this app, but they will it'll say they do not have access. And there's a little option if they want to request it. And remember, it's going to go to the individual in question that you specified. So that is a link you can do and share however you see fits. 
Um, the app is there now. If you ever need to make adjustments, you can. Um, if you back out of this real quick, you can see it says update app now. If I wanted, let's say, because uh, remember, I didn't include the um, uh, the page and a report. Let's say in a week's time, it's ready to go. I can just add this, right? And say, oh, this is ready. But if you do add an object, it automatically is hidden for your audiences. So make sure to say, well, you just added a new object. In which of these audiences should it be made available? So it's kind of a two-part process there that you got to make sure that you follow along with. So I'm not going to add it, so I don't need to make any changes. Uh, but now the last thing I'm going to show before we go on our break is what's this whole installing thing, right? Because if I go over to apps, we can see right now, where is my Learn with the Nerds Power BI admin? It's not here, right? If Devin checked, he doesn't have it. If Matt checked, he doesn't have it, so on and so forth, right? Even though we're workspace admins, we don't see this because I did not install it automatically. The way to install this is, um, it's just kind of an odd phrasing, but you can hit get apps and this will present itself. These are all the apps, right? So you can see this actually traverses, there's Microsoft Corp ones. We got some retail examples. Yeah, there's something here from an organization we work with, but you can see this traverses not just Pragmatic Works. If I wanna make this easy on myself, this app will show up here, but I'm gonna go over to my organizational app. So these are only things that have been basically published from apps inside of the Pragmatic Works tenant. So nice, cleaner, more streamlined. We can see there's that icon, learn with the nerds, Power BI admin, enjoy this awesome app. I can see my name. Devin would see this as too. And he would just get, get it now. It says installing app. We got that nice little green theme. And here it is, launching us into the report. If I click on this, it'll actually launch this URL in this tab. We were talking about that. Um, and yeah, here, here it is. And now if I ever go to the actual app section, it appears. This is what installing the app means. It just puts it in the app section. So anytime it gets updated now, I will see that in real time. So if I go here, if that, you know, the page and a report shows up, boom, it's going to be there for me, so on and so forth. But at this point, you're just basically navigating and consuming whatever objects have been available inside of this. You want to reach out to whoever is responsible for this. There's me because I said I was the owner. And if you click on this, it literally will use whatever your default emailing tool is. And you can be like, hey, uh, I was checking out your app. I got a question about this or that. That's one way to go about it. But don't forget also that you always have the uh, availability of kind of adding comments. So don't forget about that little piece, which is kind of fun. You know, I could just say, hey, uh, Devin, what's going on here? Right? You can use the whole app thing and you can tag people there too. So either hit the drop down and email the actual owner or you can tag people in here so that they can see some of your commentary. But that is the kind of method of not only creating your app, but really how you're going to be managing and maintaining this. Uh, of course, if you ever need to, don't forget, find your workspace in question where that app resides, go to the update option, and you can always change or modify who, like Matt, I don't want Matt to have access to this anymore. Give him the trash can. He's out of here. So this is where you would kind of manage and maintain that. So what we're going to do, guys, is we're going to take our small break, This uh, just this one little break for this afternoon, and then we're going to return and keep on going. Uh, what I'll do is as soon as I return back from the break itself is I'll give you a quick little rundown on a couple of things related to on-demand learning, and I'll take a look at potentially at other questions that might reside there. So let me go ahead and I'll put a little 15-minute timer on my screen. So we'll put that here. I'm going to go to screen share, and let's pop that up to 15 minutes. So take your time, enjoy your break. We'll be back.
All right, guys. Um, hopefully just a simple little break. That was sufficient for you. I know three hours in a row is kind of tough, but hopefully it's going well. we got lots still to go through, so let's keep this a moving. But before we dive right back and continue where we left off, right? We just went through apps, talked about that fun stuff. We're actually going to transition to the day gateway. I did want to bring up a couple small items. One, there's a couple of questions I want to deal with. But second, you might have been noticing we have these little banners going across I did kind of talk about already the on-demand learning, but do remember um, that you can sign up for on-demand learning. Um, you can see there's a little QR code right in there, just learning.pragmaticworks.com. Uh, you can go through that process. Uh, you know, just get signed up. You can use a trial for seven days. It gives access to all the classes. If I haven't bored you already with uh, some of the stuff we've been going through, um, then I think you'll enjoy what we have there, right? Um, one thing I like to have kind of come through any type, I'm doing any sort of presentation, whether it's Learn With The Nerds, virtual mentoring, private training, public training, when I'm just recording videos by myself, energy and excitement is what we tried to do here, right? We want you guys to learn, but we also want it to be fun. So hopefully it comes through that the stuff that I'm talking about, I, we use ourselves and we have a ton of fun around it. So we love teaching it. Um, funny enough, we have lots of teachers that have, that are on our team. That was their, that was their background. Like that's where they come from. So we we're pretty proud of the way that we're able to translate the information on you learning how to become experts in these technologies, but have fun along the way. So definitely check it out. We got over 85 courses on there. This class, once it's done and recorded, will be made available on there for free as well. So definitely check it out. And also until Monday at midnight, I believe that's right. If it's wrong, somebody let me know. But I'm pretty sure until Monday midnight, for anyone that's going to be new to joining our on-demand learning platform, there is a sale going on. So you can take advantage of that. So a couple little items there. I'd love for you guys to join the Pragmatic Works family. So check it out. Uh, if you're not tired of seeing my face, you will be after a couple of those classes, but I'd love to have you. Now, a couple of questions. Let me just kind of put these on here real quick, right? We got this question, not that question. We got this question right here. Is there a number of audience an app can have? To be honest, I have not seen any sort of outward limitation here, nor have I tested the bounds, right? So there might be an outward limit here, but I've not read or seen of anything. So if there is, it's a very high number. So that's a good thing. Uh, we also have here, can you move existing data sets, reports, dashboards into a new workspace? So when it comes to, it depends on the object in question that we're discussing. So if I go back to our workspace here, right? For reports and dashboards, um, you can. Right? If we just go into like this report here, I can literally go and say file. Um, actually, this is not the report I wanted to go into. But if I go here, and where is my little... I click the right one. There's two here. Is this the blank one? Let me check what's going on here. Oh, what was this other one? It's weird that there's two there. They might have deployed it twice, but maybe that was that new report I created. Very odd one. But right here, if we go down, we do have the option of saving a copy. And you can see that you can very easily choose a different workspace and off to the races you go. So that is a very easy route to basically move a report. The interesting part is the data set will actually remain here. And actually, that's a process I've been seeing more and more where users will actually keep their data sets confined into one workspace and they'll actually deploy the reports into another kind of segmenting, um, like almost decoupling. They're obviously still connected, but separating those layers between workspaces. So I have seen that approach. So when it comes to that object and artifact, that is a very easy way that you can move um, those objects in between. But like I said, it doesn't move the data set, but you can actually move the data set. Let me actually bring you this. I'm going to provide a link in the chat here. The, for a data set, the process that's actually used is you simply go ahead and um, you got to move the data set. There are some things you can do with like XMLA endpoints, but you effectively just redeploy the data set to the new workspace. Now, the one issue that that could cause is potentially the binding of connections. So if you move something there, there could be a problem with basically where it's pointing to since it would be referencing an old workspace. But um, there is a link here that I'm going to uh, kind of pass along. I'm going to give this to Devin in the background. Uh, it goes to the official Microsoft documentation on how you can rebind a report 
using uh, the REST API. So a little bit beyond the scope of what we're going through because it does get into just making these commands and these calls, but there are ways that you can go about leveraging that process, going through that process. Hey, Manuel, just to bring up to you, one of the things I answered in the chat around that was, I don't think you're covering it today, or maybe if you are very briefly, <clears throat> the idea of deployment pipelines as well, where you can use them to move from one environment to another. Sure. Uh, reports and data sets and that sort of thing. So Correct. And and we are going to be, that is actually one of the latter parts of this. Actually, near the very end, we have a little section on data flows, which that is absolutely another way you can do it. Pipelines, though, is tied to specific workspaces. So um, the methods we were just talking about is if you just want to move from A to B and there's no connection between them. But yes, with pipelines, you can effectively um, bring together three defined workspaces that represent a dev, test, and a prod. And then you can move them very easily between one versus the other. Um, and then most recently, actually, as part of the November release, they did officially bring to the table a Visual Studio extension for Azure DevOps, which gives additional capabilities of using Azure DevOps for actually your continuous integration, continuing operator, so your CICO. You can actually use Azure DevOps. And one of those options was managing artifacts in workspaces. So I believe you could also do that through Azure DevOps. That's not something we're going into in today. That's literally a GA feature that was as of two days ago. So that's super recent, but anyone who maybe is in the Azure DevOps side of things, something to potentially kind of look into as it does have uh, some cool little capabilities there. So definitely something I think good to check out. And yes, we are gonna be looking at uh, deployment pipelines a little bit later on. Yeah, I don't know what that other object was. I just got rid of it. So very weird. Uh, I think, let me see. I think there's one more question. Will organizational apps be visible to everyone in the organization or will only users have access? So in that get apps section that we looked at, in the way that I did it, only the people who have access to it would see it there. Now that link that was available, which you can always get, right? If I go over here and I hit copy link, this technically can be shared with anybody. But once again, it takes them to the app and it only gives them the opportunity to request access. So this is one way, but you might have, I might have skimmed past it pretty quickly. There is an option here for entire organization. So if you do choose entire organization, they do automatically disable the install app automatically. But if you decide to deploy your app with this option selected, it is available for everyone to see when they hit get apps and they can install it manually themselves. So there's a couple different ways to maybe answer that question. So hopefully, um, hopefully that answers what you're looking for. All right, well, let's keep this ball rolling. Um, like I said, in the slides that I provided to you, I've given a great degree, far more slides than what we're going to be covering today. So we are going to cover the data gateway. I have way more content in the slides that you've been provided in the PDF itself than we're going to go through just for the time management of it. But we're going to discuss a data gateway as there have been some not only user interface changes, but also kind of some changes in how you invite users to it. This isn't a rather recent update or change, but just in case for those who haven't been keeping an eye on it, there have been some adjustments. Right. So what is the data gateway? What do we need it for? And this is going to be for refreshing our reports. But obviously, there's some caveats to that because some reports won't require the data gateway, but some will. So, of course, we're going to talk about those nuances in there and we'll focus more on the scenarios where you need to. Technically, the report that I deployed, that dashboard in a day, is pointing to data sources that exist in CSVs, Excels, and one of the sources is actually a folder on my physical machine. So it is an on-prem source, multiple sources, that we need to find a way that the cloud service can communicate with it to bring that data up to refresh the information. Because in this imported style of report that we're working with, right? if you're using import, basically if you're unfamiliar with the choice of import versus direct query, certain sources, mainly relational database sources, will give you an option for connectivity. If you don't see this option when you're connecting, then you're importing. Basically, you're copying all the data and information from your source system, and it's being stored locally in the Power BI report itself. So it's static. Basically, I can share a PBX report that's imported with anyone in the world. And when they open it, they'll see the data because it's not they don't have to go into the actual SQL server or the Excel file. We brought that and stored it in the report itself. It sits there statically in the model. So naturally, when we deploy it to the service, we need a way to update that information. And the data gateway is going to be the key to that very process. 
So we're going to look at, you know, where do you go and download the data gateway? Uh, something that hasn't changed is there's really two options for installation. Um, a lot of times the term that is used here is the enterprise data gateway versus personal gateway. Uh, but realistically, technically, it's just called standard mode versus personal mode. But standard just doesn't sound fancy. So we use a lot of times, and you'll see it out there, people say enterprise data gateway. And it's the, I think it's a very correct way to phrase it because it really describes what it's meant, its usage case. Uh, so we're going to look at that. We're going to look at that process. We're going to look where you download it. As I mentioned, I'm not going to go through that download process. and Well, I'm not going to go through the install process just because it takes a little bit of time. And if it hangs up, that could cause issues. And I won't really be able to show anything. So we're going to walk through it. And I'm going to kind of describe to you some of the expectations. So who, right? It's really just about the report once again. Is it imported? If it is something that's using a source like a relational database that could leverage what's called a direct query or potentially a live connection, things like analysis services uh, on-prem, let's say, um, well, technically on-prem wouldn't, but a live connection to like a Power BI data set or Azure analysis services, uh, those would be basically cloud native solutions. These do not require actually needing to configure those sources with the data gateway. We don't need that in between, right? That gateway serves as the bridge between on-premises sources to the cloud network itself, right? If you're using an Excel workbook inside of a SharePoint library and you set that up correctly, that also does not require the data gateway and it will automatically refresh every hour. There are ways to manipulate that as well. So, Different scenarios will require gateways or not. And actually, there's some great documentation because new sources get added all the time. All the time, there's new sources. This is one of those great things that this kind of uh, connectivity capability that Power BI has, which is fantastic already. Almost every release, it seems like something's coming into beta, something's turning GA. So you always want to kind of keep your finger on the pulse of this. If you just literally go and type in like Power BI data sources, I think that's it if, in your you know Google or whatever you want. Um, let me bring that up real quick. I'm pretty sure that'll get you where you need to go. There's literally a, um, a list right here. Here you go. Massive list. And it tells you gateway required, right? And some scenarios where it's not required, but it's supported, there might be some kind of caveats to it. But this is, look, A to B, because, gosh, there's so many awesome capabilities within Power BI. So you can see this is a long scrolling list, and it lets you know, are you going to need to use the gateway for this? And there's like little added notes, you know, you go down here, down below, and it'll say, okay, for number three, it requires for on-prem version of this technology. So it tells you any sort of small things, but just right here, just Power BI data sources, that's what I Google searched, and here it is. And as new sources get added, this is where you can go to find out what are my requirements there. So you can see, I mean, it's kind of a blend. Um, it's once at the end of the day, usually native cloud connections versus on-prem is going to be your go-to. Uh, but there's some other reference material in here that we provided for this purpose. So just keep an eye on that um, as new sources come into play. Find out, you know, what am I going to be needing to do here? So once again, Gateway is that bridge between our on-prem sources inside of, and, and technically you can see it's not necessarily, it's not just Power BI. And I have it installed, and when we bring up the actual on-premise data gateway, I'll bring it up in a moment, we'll see that this is serving the purpose for the entirety of the Power Platform. Right. So we're talking about Power Apps, Power Automate. Um, we can even get into Logic Apps and as well Azure Analysis Services. So it goes beyond even just what we're covering here today. It's actually the same gateway service for all of them. So that's pretty neat and cool. One big thing is, though, and we won't see it on the screen, but during the installation process, by default, the installer will install this. And this is you, there's actually documentation when you're going through the installer. Region plays a big role in this. Um, whatever the native region is for your Power BI tenant, if you're going to use the gateway for Power BI refreshes, it needs to be set up and installed in that same region. And I'll show you real quick. How do I know what region my tenant is in? It's very easy. It's right in that home rib, like right in the ribbon where we saw what license we have. You go there, and you can see where it is. And the nice thing is the installer helps you. If you decide and say, oh, I'm, why is it choosing this region? Because maybe you don't know that's where your Power BI tenant is. And you go to change it and say, oh, I'm going to do East US. It'll tell you, hey, X is, this is not in the same tenant. This can work for other services like Azure Analysis Services, Logic Apps. But for Power BI, it has to be in the same tenant as your Power BI service. So 
There's a big conversation around regions, especially Azure services, but that is definitely a different conversation, different day. But for our perspective, for what we need to know, the gateway needs to be installed in the same region as our Power BI tenant, period, for Power BI, that is. So we can go, we can choose what to install. It's actually readily available to you to get to the downloader right inside of the Power BI service. And it's, once again, we have some reference slides in here to kind of remind you where you might need it, where you might not. But I've already provided you that kind of master internal documentation from Microsoft that will stay up to date with all the newest connections of does it need it or does it not? Now, the personal mode isn't really ever anything you're going to be utilizing. There is one circumstance and situation that you may need to leverage it. And that is actually in situations where you might be using R or Python extensions in Power BI. You're actually running R or Python to connect to sources or use some uh, data cleansing inside the Power Query Editor. If you're actually utilizing this as of right now, and I think they're going to be adjusting it, you do actually have to, if you have a report and you need to refresh it, it actually has to be refreshed with a personal gateway. And that gateway needs to be installed on a machine that actually has access to either the R underlying libraries or the Python, depending on what you're using. So a little bit extra complexity there. It's a very one-off scenario. It's just for that. Um, that's where I'd say maybe even in an organizational situation, you might use the personal gateway. But other than that scenario, the standard or enterprise gateway is where you want to go. This is how you can invite other users to it. And once again, in the past, the only thing that they had was the ability of adding admins to a gateway. That has since changed. And now you can invite users and say what they should be able to do. And I think it's a much uh, a pretty good change that they introduced. So more kind of referential stuff here for you to kind of go through and check out. What we're going to do is we're actually going to dive into the service. I'm going to show you where you can download it. I'm going to bring up my data gateway, which has been installed, and how it presents itself and how we can invite users to that inside of the service. So this metric here, this uh, kind of just uh, image just to show you, here's basically all of your Power Platform and beyond technically. We have the gateway, which uses um, encryption. So the Azure Service Bus is what Al Azure Services use to encrypt data in movement. That's in play here. So as the data is moving from your on-prem network to the cloud, it is encrypted the entirety of the time. So if you're concerned and worried about um, data breaches or something, fully encrypted uh, data and movement and data at rest. So that's just a, this is a quick little info, little, little image of what's up. So let's actually go in and look at where we can actually download this gateway and how the configuration looks and all of that fun stuff um, throughout that process. So let me go ahead and bring that up here. Uh, I'm, you can be wherever you want in the Power BI service, but over here in the right-hand corner, this is where you can easily and quickly download a couple of fun things. You can download the Power BI desktop. So if you want that November release, that takes you to the link. This will let you download the data gateway, the newest version of the Paginated Report Builder, so on and so forth. So you click the data gateway and it takes you right to where you need to go and you decide. Do you want that standard mode, which once again, I like to call it enterprise, or do you want to do personal? And hopefully um, that kind of conversation I had would give you a description of when you want to use personal. I mean, if you're doing stuff, you know, like training or learning, like let's say you're on the ODL classes, obviously the personal mode might be something you install locally for your machine, but it's personal. Like no one else will have access to it. No one else can modify it. If you're updating a data set with a personal um, uh, gateway and something's wrong, no one else will be able to adjust or amend it, right? So that's a, something we always need to take into consideration on that. So make your choice, pick your poison, if you will. You download it, very simple, small package, and then you run through that installation process. Pretty straightforward. You just give it a name. Um, you need to decide what region it's going to be in. And then you also need to specify a backup key. So if for any reason you need to, because it gets installed on a machine, right? Normally, you wouldn't install it on your personal machine. This would be installed usually by someone on the administration side. That's why it's in this class. And it would be put on some sort of application server, something that's there, has a great amount of resources, usually is always on, has backup. You can set up gateways in clusters. You can set it up as um, failovers as well. So there are some settings you can kind of add into the mix there. But at the end of the day, give it a name. You specify if it's going to be part of a cluster what region it's going to be in, and its recovery key, which you need if you're going to migrate or if you, you know, disaster recovery, anything like that. The only other aspect of it is who the owner 
of the gateway is going to be. And generally, this will be some sort of service account, right? Once that's installed and it's available on the service, you can invite other users as admins to kind of configure your data gateway appropriately. So you download that, you get the gateway installed. I'm going to bring mine up right here. Bring that up here one moment. And you can see this is because it's it's installed on my personal desktop here. And I'm logging in with an email address that uh, I used for this option, right, for when I installed this. Normally, this would be like, once again, a service account. And once again, you'd only ever access this. Like you'd have to be on the machine where it's installed to actually get to what we're looking at right now. Usually the other way we go about about it is right here. You can see manage gateways, which we'll go to momentarily. But this is me on the physical machine where this service runs because it's a service that's running. That's how it's able to connect to the private network. It's part of that network. So here's my gateway. It's on my desktop. It talks about my Power Apps, Power Automate, North Central US environment. Power BI is using the default environment, which how do I know what that is? Once again, right here, same place. I can go to this little help and support and you can see about Power BI and this is going to be organizationally specific, right? This is the default location, North Central US for Pragmatic Works. And technically there's this tenant URL that comes into play with like um, multi-tenant scenarios, but it can be helpful, but that's outside of the lens of what we're covering. But it's right there, little question mark about, and that's where you can find it if you're uncertain. When you're going through the installer though, it literally shows you in the list of all your regions, it'll say recommended around your Power BI's home tenant. So it's pretty hard to make a mistake here, right? But it's there, it's running. I could make adjustments saying, hey, you know what? This service is running using these credentials, right? It creates a service account that runs locally on this machine. So if I needed to have access to a folder, a directory, something inside this private network, this is the account that I would want to be granting access to. You can either go that route, or if you already have some sort of service account that's available to you with the permissions already defined, you can just change it and have this service be run with a different service account that's already been configured. Your choice, configure the default one, or maybe someone has created a service account for something previous and that will work for our scenario and you can take advantage of it. But this is just monitoring that service locally on the machine. What about over here in the gateway? So we go over, I can go to manage gateways and what I will see here by default, and that's because I have elevated permissions here. These are all effectively the data sources that I have access to effectively across the workspaces where I have deployed data sets. These are the effective basically connections that are there. And they haven't been associated with any clusters yet, any gateways. So technically nothing here has been set up to actually be refreshed if it needs to be. In my list of on-premise gateways, I have two actually, right? Um, that I'm an admin to. This one is the one uh, that's on this machine. And I actually have one over here on my laptop, but my laptop's off. So you'll see when I try to get the status, it's offline. Well, obviously the desktop works. Um, but we can invite users. Something has changed here in this, which is pretty cool. Settings, there's not much to do here other than do you want to allow users, you know, do this or that, add a department, add a description. It's not uncommon to have multiple gateways within an organization. This could be for workload balancing scenarios. This could be simply for just separating um, the work between various different departments. But there's no cost to the gateway itself. So it's just for you to manage. The settings here or the manage users, this is where it's changed slightly since its original inception. Historically, before you literally just had your gateway and then you got to invite admins. That was it. Now, when you invite someone, you get to decide. So Devin, I'm gonna invite him into this uh, item. What do I want to make him? What permissions do I want to grant Devin here? Should he be a connection creator? So he can't, as you can see, all it does is allows him to leverage this gateway to create a connection. Do I want him to be able to reshare also access to this? Or do I want to just straight up make him an admin? And you can see down below, there are some specific types of sources that you can limit. Maybe Devin should only be able to create connections to SQL Server. That's what I want to limit him to for creating uh, data gateway connections for. You can be pretty granular with this. So something to consider and something to look into. This is now how you add users. Now, when you do have elevated access and permissions, you'll notice 
Um, I don't have any virtual network data gateway. Sometimes you might have that in play, but they would show up here. But I have this little toggle over here, right? And this is simply because of my permissions, but I can actually look at all the gateways that exist that are tied to the Pragmatic Works organization. So yes, me personally, I'm tied to two gateways. I created both of them, so I'm default the owner of them. But I can see everybody's gateways here, right? And technically, I could delete them. I could go and add users to it. This is the administrative side of it. But we can go in and actually make adjustments or amendments to this, right? So this is the admin side of things. So you can add users if you have the right permissions. You can actually modify and add people to other uh, gateways. Really, you have to just decide how you want to leverage this. And when it comes about actually leveraging it, which may or may not be, a lot of times this does fall under the administrative side of things, but when you want to leverage a gateway. So like I said, this report right here has three sources. It's connecting to a folder and two different files, a CSV and an Excel workbook, if I remember. If I tried to refresh this, it would fail, right? Just go in here. If I go to my data set itself and say, hey, you know what? I want to do a refresh now. This will fail. Right. And if I go over here real quick to the schedule refresh, you can see it failed and you can see because one data source credential is missing. Effectively, we don't have this set up with the gateway and you can see it right here when we go down below gateway connection. I don't have anything chosen. It's red. Um, I, you know, I want to use one, but it's not available to me. This can somewhat be a time consuming process. But the nice part is when you configure a source. So let's say in this one. I was using and leveraging a connection to like Azure SQL database. In this case, I'm not. You can see I'm doing everything local. But let's say I did another report and it actually was based off of maybe the information in this folder. Once I've created a data source to a gateway, that source, so future reports that might use this folder path, that has already been configured and you can leverage that. So once you create a data source, it is reusable for future and other reports. So it takes a little bit of time initially, but once you get it set up, you are good to go. So if I wanted to be able to refresh this, I would literally have to go one by one on these. And I'll just do one of these so you can see an example and say, I want to add this to a gateway. I'm going to add this to my desktop. What do I want to call this? This was the international sales folder. So I'm going to call it international sales, right? You can see this is the path right there. Uh, I'll just call it folder. I mean, it is a folder type. You can see it's automatically chosen that for me. How do I want to authenticate? In this case, since we're pointing to a physical location, it is going to be a Windows account, but this could potentially also, once again, be a service account. Since I'm accessing my desktop, I'm going to go ahead and use my credentials. If I type this correctly, like I didn't, and then you can choose a privacy level if you want. Oh, this is organizational. And when I hit create here, this is actually going to attempt to connect. If I failed and I typed in something wrong, like I just did, um, let me see here. I think I just typed this wrong. Windows. Actually, there's one thing I always check. Let me try one thing. Uh, where is... Oops, I don't think that's correct here. I might be typing my password even wrong. Uh, where is it? There we go. Let's try that again. Are you going to play nicely? Mm -mm -mm. So that's just something with mine. It should work. Oh, you know what? Oh, no, that's correct. Oh, no, that's not correct. Um, <laughs> that's actually, it's an invalid file path. I'd have to update that. For some reason, I thought I deployed a valid report, but I'm fairly certain if I look for C dyad, it doesn't exist. So this is a simple issue where the report that I actually deployed out here uh, is pointing to the wrong file. This uh, That's all that is. And it says it in the message. I was looking at it, unable to connect the data source. So my credentials are right. This is just doesn't exist. So that's a little bit of a silly mistake on my behalf that I deployed a report to do it. So what I would need to do is actually go to my report, make sure I update these correct settings. Let me look at it right quick here. Yeah, so I would need to actually go into the report itself and update this actually in the report. I thought I had saved it with the updated configurations, but silly me, I must not have. 
But that is the process you would go through. You would simply go through, provide the necessary credentials. As long as that file path actually exists, um, it would go successful. And then I would have this ability to map it. And once again, any report moving forward that would be leveraging the same gateway would have this data source already available for mapping purposes. But in order to schedule the refresh for anything that needs it, for any of those on-prem source Power BI reports, you have to go through this. You have to effectively make sure that all data sources included in the data set have been taken care of inside of the gateway in question. So very important piece of the puzzle. You just got to make sure you line it up just right. So, But the process we saw, it matches exactly what we went through. Hopefully, you just have an actual valid file path like silly old me didn't do. But gateway is critical. We need that as part of this overall process, right? Oops, I accidentally launched SSMS. So once we have that gateways and those are on play and administering, what are some other aspects we want to look into in overall Power BI? And of course, security, right? We've already kind of talked about it. And there was a question earlier about, hey, you know, can I go ahead and disable the ability of allowing users to publish to web? That was a question we saw earlier. And I mentioned, yes, uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Well, we're getting to that later right now. So I'm getting to the place where I can make sure and see if there's any other questions. All right, cool. Um, so we're going to get into that, right? So general overview, right? Uh, Microsoft Trust Center, that's a pretty important one. You can go in there and kind of it. This is more not necessarily organization specific. This is Microsoft and Azure kind of showcasing what all access and security that they are compliant with and all of that. So if you're not certain and you want to go look through this, literally you can go to the Microsoft Trust Center, navigate through this. Mm -hmm. And access and see, okay, for Microsoft Azure, you can go through the different types of projects. I want to go to the Power Platform. I want to know a little bit more about Power BI, the security, GDPR, right? Very important, compliance. And it walks you through the process of what benchmarks, what global compliance offering, offerings that, in this case, Power BI falls under, right? So it has everything at the surface level, everything up front, so you know exactly what the case is. If you have some very strict restrictions, Microsoft have made this very forward facing. That's the idea behind it. So the trust center is there for us to leverage. We've already kind of talked about this when it comes to Power BI, when it comes to sharing, when it comes to access to workspaces, when it boils down to role level security, uh, Azure Active Directory is gonna be key and paramount here, right? <clears throat> so AAD is gonna be utilized effectively across the board. When I was going in and throwing the Office 365 groups, this is tied with that Azure Active Directory. So very important, that's how it's utilized, these managed identities from Azure itself. There's a very deeper conversation when it comes to the actual Azure Active Directory and all of that can be accomplished there, but uh, that's effectively what Power BI leverages for this process. Now, multi-factor authentication, of course, is something optional. This is handled as well, once again, inside of the like admin center when you go into users. I'll uh, kind of bring this over here. Where we saw here, you can go to your users, you can see right away at the very top, it says multi-factor authentication. And you can see in this list, if we go through and I find somebody, let me just go right here, I saw someone, there's Alexa. Right, if I go ahead and select her, if I wanted to go and uh, go MFA, I can go in here and say multi-factor authentication, it launches this other view of this, and it'll tell me if someone is disabled, if it is enabled, or is it enforced? So if I were to go look over here once again, Oops, let me go to, uh, I'll just go to the global admins here, I'll shorten the list up. Uh, we can see everybody's enforced. Ben here is disabled. So if I wanted to, I could literally enable this for him. Uh, and you can see it says here, if we wanted to, if next time Ben would log in and sign in through a browser to the Power BI portal, the Azure portal, anything associated with the Pragmatic Works tenant, he'll be prompted. It'll say your organization um, is requiring further uh, abilities to log in, right? And you can choose, am I going to do it by phone? Am I going to do it with the app, right? You get choices, but you have to set something up. Um, and you can actually forego that if it's simply enabled. Enforce will push that process and they can't continue any further. You can see it gives you this link that you can go to. So if I go over here and just view this, obviously this is going to be using my account, but if Ben was there, I could say, hey, I did this for you. I know you don't really log into stuff. Go ahead and set this up. So this is me going through. It's not actually Ben, but I can decide how I want to set this up. 
Now, for me, I already have this set up for my mobile application. It reminds me. But secondly, if I want to change how I do MFA, I can. So an additional area, it is an organizational decision. You can see you can decide if you want to do this at an individual level. There is ways to also do this in bulk as well. And there is main documentation that you can go through when it comes to that process of doing this kind of uh, as a lump sum. So there's a couple of ways you can go about adding uh, MFA to the mix. You can see the bulk update if you want to go that route. Uh, but this adds another layer potentially to the authentication process. Pretty critical. I mean, we use the mobile application ourselves. So that really just ensures security. We do travel. We're over in different places, you know. So I just, I have my face authentication on my phone too. So well, actually I've been doing it throughout this class, right? Whenever I had to log in, I have to authenticate there. So another layer of security, MFA. I know sometimes as an end user, you're like, oh, not one more thing, but um Obviously, Paramount uh, is security and governance of this data. So you kind of, you know, need to consider the MFA is a pretty popular item as well. Something that uh, is in the documentation here, but we're not going to go into it. For mobile device management, this is something that's handled by something called Intune. So this is how you can make it. So organizations, uh, some of you might be familiar with this, um, your phone will effectively be tied to the organization, which actually would allow um Office 365 administrators that have access to this back end, if you were to say, hey, my phone got stolen, it's got this information, you could technically use this uh, service in tune to remotely wipe that phone out, right? Um, I think iPhone offers that so you can do it yourself personally, but in tune and these types of process, basically you have to agree to it and it ties your phone to the organization. Um, so usually those are like business phones that will associate a little bit. Organization will just give you that. But Intune is the application that you use to kind of manage this process. So we've already taken the time to look at MFA and kind of go through this process. So we won't need to go in and explore that anymore. But there's even more, right? Things like role level security. So whereas MFA is something organizationally coming into the lens and focus of RLS we can go ahead now at a, and this is, we are gonna focus around this around Power BI, but do know and understand that role level security exists in other technologies. So things like SQL Server, role level security is there. Things like Azure Analysis Services, role level security is there. So you could implement this elsewhere. And realistically, if you have more of an architectural discussion, if you're gonna be using SQL Server as a primary means and a source that you're gonna be pulling data into let's say your power bi data sets or let's say like data marts when they're coming up um, rather than potentially implement things at the data set and the data mart level if you just implement role of security at the sql server level uh, you can leverage that now every report you're, you're centralizing this work here because if i create a role level security inside of this power bi model right here uh, and I'm creating a new power bi data set that's not like a live connection to that one's its own new power bi data set I'd have to create RLS over here, right? So there's a bit of duplication of effort if you kind of do it at the lowest level. Um, basically always, right? The, the higher upstream that we can perform certain actions, the better it's going to be. We only want to push things downstream as necessary as it has to be. So in this case, if you can go higher up than the Power BI level for RLS, you should, right? And what we're speaking about is, hey, I can now have one report and depending on who's looking at it, they'll see the records from this state and this user will see the record from that state or whatever criteria you deem to dictate what user A should see versus what user B should see. This is very important, right? Sometimes organizations who aren't familiar with this or aren't comfortable with implementing it, they just don't know the route, which it isn't that difficult as we're going to see some very rudimentary examples here. Um, the If you don't use RLS and you need, you know, group A to only see this info and group B to only see this info, uh, now you're having to create multiple data sets, right? So now you're creating more objects you need to manage and maintain versus having one report that has all the data that services this massive wide audience and individuals only see what they need to see. Now to kind of go back in time to something we were discussing at the beginning of these three hours, remember our workspace access and the work roles. And I was once again talking about, hey, you know, only report authors and admins need to be added to a workspace. It's not really what you should be using for your end users. The viewer role is there. If you invite someone as a viewer to a workspace, then you're okay. 
But, and I've seen this happen quite a few times, if you decide to invite users, let's say as a contributor, and this is a read-only user, and you invite them as a contributor into a workspace, your RLS is not going to work. Basically, that access will supersede what you've set up in RLS. So that can break this. I have had a ton of times where people take the time and effort. They have RLS implemented. But when my user goes, they see all the data. Well, have you invited them into the workspace as something higher than a viewer? If it's the answer is yes, that's your problem. So just something to keep into consideration here when we talk about RLS. So as of right now, if, you, if we focus around the idea of Power BI data sets, this is a two-part process on how we kind of implement this. Uh, the desktop tool is where we actually create the roles. Basically, we, we define the filtering using DAX. Once you deploy that out to the actual workspace, then you can assign your users from the Azure Active Directory to it. So here's a role. The users can only see a specific state. Um, that's all they're going to see. And then I assign Deb into it. I assign Mitchell to it. But once again, considering where they're at in the workspace. So that is the kind of traditional way to do this. Um, I'm just going to throw it out there. It may prompt other questions, but just know I'm just because it's so on the tip of my mind and so fresh and so new for me. Um, there is another kind of experience with data marts that you actually take care of roles and assignments all within the data mart UI. So it's all in the service, actually. So I kind of like how they consolidated that there. But uh, like I said, you can absolutely do it at the data set level. You just have to kind of break it apart one versus the other. So as far as basic RLS goes, right? Um, very straightforward. When we talk about basic, we're talking about like static or hard coding this information. So literally a role that let's say we call this role Duval County, right? Because this is saying I want to make it so this role that I create filters down this table to only show records for Duval County. What this does is it leverages the actual basically model you've designed, the interactive filtering that exists via the relationships it's going to limit it down. Whatever table you choose, it's going to filter it down to just those items and objects. The trick of this is obviously the downside is this could result in you having to create many, 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 many different roles, right? If you want one report to satisfy all these different groups, you might have to create a role for every one of those groups. And if something changes there, you have to go one by one by one. So depending on the scenario, if it's a really basic kind of design or setup for your row level security, this could work for you, right? The basic element could work for you, but as you start expanding the kind of uh, variety of rules that you need to incorporate, static will kind of lose its luster. So we're gonna look at a couple of examples here. Uh, but I've actually provided the resources in your folders for more than just the two we're gonna look at. Um, but this is also just showing, hey, if you use direct query, you can actually leverage and support this here. Live connection does not support RLS basically because the models you connect to, the only thing you connect to live connection anymore is Power BI data sets, Azure analysis services, and then the on-prem options. Uh, if you're gonna be using live connection and you want RLS, you have to do it in the underlying source. So if you're using Azure analysis services, you're making a live connection to it from Power BI, you're not gonna be able to do row level security at the report level. That needs to already have been done at the Azure Analysis Services level. So just a small thing to keep in mind there. So I said, gonna do some pretty quick examples here on an RLS uh, in those resources that you've gotten. If I go and find my way back to that, we're gonna see that in the class resources, I have some RLS items. I'm just gonna open up this basic security example. The sources that have been used for this are located in your download as well. Um, if you kind of wanna tinker with it and toy with it and update it, because obviously, RLS is specific to your organization and we're specifying email addresses. So for me, obviously that's pragmatic works. So for you to do it, you gotta do your own email addresses. So for this scenario, we can see that we have this report here. Um, it's just medical information, basically internationally, but we're gonna do a little fun with it. Uh, we're gonna do that whole Duval, Florida element. Actually, let me uh, make sure that I get my right uh, instructions for this one second. Mm -hmm. Bring this over here. All right, cool. And uh, let's set it up. Two-part process, though. We can test this here. I'm going to go over to the modeling ribbon. You're going to see there's an option that says manage roles, right? And the way this is presented is you see all of the objects that exist inside of this model. Maybe. There we go. 
So you can see I'm creating a new role and there's all the tables. So the reason why I'm mentioning this is if in certain models, you might actually be importing tables that you will end up hiding. So you don't actually have them present in the report view just because of what their purpose is. Um, we'll see that in the next example, but everything will show up here. All hidden tables, hidden columns, they will all show up here. But then you have to decide, right? What is this role that I'm gonna be using? So in this one, I'm gonna go ahead and do that example, right? We're, uh, you know, Pragmatic Works is situated in Jacksonville, Florida. We're actually not in Duval County, um, but uh, the main county, if you ever watch a Jaguars game, you might hear that Duval. So that's like kind of at the heart of Jacksonville there. So I'm gonna call this Duval County. This is static example. So then we choose our tables and you have to specify in the table in question, which column do we wanna apply a filter to? So you can see here are all of my columns. So I'm gonna use this county state option down here at the bottom and say, I wanna create a filter against county state. And at this point, this is just DAX. So this can be far more complex. You can do like if statements, you can use contain string function, you can do ands or ors, right? We could do that, right? Maybe I wanna do Duval or Polk County. So the idea here is, let me go ahead and set this up and put in, cause it's a text column, I have to write it exact, that's not exact, Duval, Florida. That's how we have it set in the data set. That looks good. And you're not gonna get much here as far as like assistance with the DAX, it's a literal string anyways, um, but we can test this, right? This obviously is a view of all of the data. If I wanna say, okay, I wanna view this as someone who would fall under that role, I can hit the view as and say, let me look at this as Duval. And you can see this is now shrunk down to one little dot on here and you can see all the filters. So the idea is once I publish this to the service, whoever I assign using their Azure Active Directory email, uh, this is all they'll see. It's literally restricting the entire thing. Remember, we've basically gone in to this table right here and eliminated access to anything other than Duval, comma, Florida. And like I said, you can get a little more creative, you know, for those who maybe enjoy and have a skill set inside of DAX, you could go in here and say, you know what, it's Duval County, or oh, uh, let's go, um, or we have Polk, Florida, something like that. And you can see that's now been added. Since I'm still viewing it through that process, you can see it's adding it to the mix. But remember, when it comes to static, uh, this potentially could be problematic in the sense that, hey, um, this is one role, right? If what, imagine if we wanted to do something for all the states. I mean, just think about how many roles that could end up being. It's just a lot of management. So this is here. This is only one part of the process though, right? So let's say I'm here. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just, I'll just save this right now, overwrite my basic report. And I'm gonna deploy this. Cause remember right now, this is, we're not gonna share this PBX with anyone. If I'm gonna share this, it's gotta go out to the cloud service. So let's put it in that workspace that we've been using. And I mean, not only do I have to put it out there so I can share it, but I haven't actually assigned anyone to this. That actually brings up another question. What if I also have users that shouldn't make, like, they should just see the report, right? That's it. I want them to have access to this, which gives me an opportunity here. Let me actually uh, log in with another account so we can kind of tinker with this real quick. One moment. All right, one second. I want to log in with another account. I don't know if I, I usually tinker with. There we go. Yeah, multi-factor authentication. So it's probably going to ask me to, yep, yeah, let me get that real quick. Okay. One, four, eight, nine. All right. So I'm just logged in. I did an incognito browser on the other side. Um, I'm logged into another called Pragmatic Works account. Um, so let's tinker with it. Let's use that, right? This is out there. It's been deployed. Uh, we obviously know that in that workspace, I have not, whatever that user was, they don't exist in here, right? Devin's the only one that has access to this PW, doesn't have access to this workspace. That's an important piece of this process. So I got this example out here. What I can do is I'm going to share. I'm not going to use an app for this one. I'm just going to go ahead and do a share here. And um, I'm going to go ahead and actually go through and do this in a different fashion. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and go to the data set itself. 
and I'm going to go to this and um, I'm going to directly share this report, right? I'm just going to go to that person I just mentioned. Uh, I'll do it so they're read only. I think their name is PW Demo. Okay. So I'm granting access to this report. I'm not inviting this account to the workspace. I'm not doing anything. I actually haven't even done any RLS for them, but they have access to this report now, right? So uh, let me go ahead and actually look over here real quick. Let's go over to our account. And this is our Learn with the Nerds. There we go. Let's go over here and look at my shared with me. Oh, browse, shared with me. That was, I think, Diab1 or something like that. One. Learn with the Nerd Power BI Admin 12.1. Perfect. This is the report I just shared with it, right? So when I go as this new user, you can see I can't see any of the content because I don't have permissions to the underlying data sets, right? So let's check and see what's going on here. If I go back over here, right, uh, I've given direct access to this. They do have read access, but the problem is I haven't done anything with this data set. This data set, which has row level security, I haven't actually assigned anyone. So if I access the settings for the data set in question, go to security, there's Duval County, no one's a part of it. If I go ahead and add Mr. PW Demo here, save this. Let's take a look at what's going on over here now. Sometimes it takes a moment for this to refresh. Oh, <laughs> um, so real quick, that's a silly one. It's a premium workspace, right? So he can't access that. Let me check. I don't think I can actually do the trial. So in this case, let me switch this real quick. I don't think I'm doing anything that I need it. Um, actually, for deployment pipelines, I would need to keep this. Yeah, no, that's fine. Let's go ahead and make a quick, small change here. This should go quickly. Let's see how, I think that should actually have a pretty quick impact. Not yet. So we'll have to give that a second, but when we go there now, this user will have access to this report, right? Let me see here, it might just be the artifact if I refresh this shared with me. Let's go here, one. I wasn't too delayed, but here I am. So the idea here, the scenario was, once we got in the right type of workspace, but you see how now access works, licensing and workspaces. When we go here, the report I had shared with PW Demo. So that is a scenario. What if I want to share this report with someone and they should be able to see everything, but I don't want to invite them to the workspace. This is a situation where you actually want to go through the process and in your report, actually create a role and you can just say like something like no filters all access whatever you want and literally you just create this there it is it exists and what i will do now is i have another role that if anyone needs to access this report and see everything this is the role i would assign them the only other way to do this without roles is that you give them elevated access within the workspace but we've talked about that that's probably not the route you want to take Creating a role that has no filters, that's how you would do it. You share the object with them and make sure they're part of the no filters role. So that is going to be how we can do that. And you can see now he is, this is his basic example. But once again, here's a scenario where you could potentially be caught with having to do tons of different scenarios here. So now I'm going to show you the kind of, I'm going to call it the upgraded way of going about this. I'm going to skip forward in um, uh, this example here, right? He said in your uh, notes and instruction, it kind of guides you through going through a kind of more organic, slower pr process of this. But I'm going to bring up the dynamic example here, which uses a little more advanced DAX, um, specifically using the lookup function. So I'm going to bring this up. It's still in the class resources. I'm going to just skip down to, not there, RLS items. I'm going to skip down to number four, bring this up. And this uses the two objects that we we were working with, right? The two same tables, 
but there's a there's two additional tables in this model as you're going to see momentarily and we'll look at them to better explain how this is going to work because we know in order for a user to access this they have to be in the Azure Active Directory they have to be logged in in their account so what happens is Power BI basically looks at that user who's logged in checks the roles and where do they fall under those roles well, instead of having multiple roles in this scenario, what we're going to do is we're actually going to go through the process and go into modeling and we're going to show a dynamic item here. So let me go ahead and get this DAX real quickly. One second. Bring this up here. And while that's loading, let me just bring this up. Let's look at the model in question. We still have those two tables right here that we were looking at before. The medical spending, it's taking its time loading. It's kind of going slow, one second. Medical spending, these were the two that we had already and we did static, we made it work. Effectively, we filtered this to specific county states. That's what we were doing. This time around, rather than leverage that, we're gonna use this whole user and provider user bridge table. Let's take a closer look at this. Our uh, DIM user has a list of email addresses. Basically, this is mimicking what Power BI will be seeing from a user that's logged into the Power BI service. This effectively represents their user principal name. So the idea is we're going to say, okay, we're going to actually tell Power, the report itself to capture who is looking at this report. We're going to do a lookup to this table. If I find a match to some of this, to, you know, something in here, then this tells me who they are. And then from there, right? We have a bridge and you can see, for instance, I am, uh, I'm user two. So if I go over here and look at this bridge table, actually I'm right here at the top. I have access to all of these underlying providers or hospitals. These are our IDs. But if you notice, if I keep scrolling down, there's a lot of entries in here. Eventually I don't have access to these right now. Of course, the scenario is I could have access to a provider, so could Mitchell. So this dynamic approach, this provider bridge table, basically lists the individual and what provider. This provider ID, of course, is gonna be potentially duplicated, as well as obviously the user ID is. But the concept is find out who's looking at it, filter it down to just their user ID, which naturally will filter down this table to just that user ID, which in turn, provider ID would filter down this provider ID right here. That's the process we're trying to do. How do we accomplish that with the DAX? So let me bring this over here one second. And I'm going to post this DAX. I'm going to walk you through it real quick. Like I said, uh, Devin, actually, I um, it's, it's a little bit of an older webinar, but he actually did an hour long just on RLS. So definitely something that you can consider and check out. But I'm going to go here and say, I'm going to make a new role. And the idea is this can be dynamic, right? And also we want to make sure maybe if you want someone, don't forget, if you want someone just to have access, you don't need to do anything in the security table. Don't forget, you can make a second role that's called no filters or whatever. But this role now is going to look at the hospital general information and still we want to filter down what hospitals we can look at. So the logic here is going to be on the provider ID. And if we look at this, we're saying, okay, only, you know, filter down the hospital general information for the matching list of provider IDs that I'm going to get you. How am I going to get you this list? Well, we're going to be doing a lookup. Go ahead and go into the provider user bridge. That's the one I showed you that had a ton of providers and a ton of user IDs and look at the provider ID. That's what we want to bring back. Right. The first argument in this first line is what do you want to return based off of your lookup condition? So bring me back list of provider IDs. And that list is going to be comprised of when the username from that table. Remember, we had the email addresses matches the user principal name. This is the DAX function, which takes whoever's looking at the report. Literally, if you go over here real quick, you can see that I've actually uh, have a report page that shows user principal name. Now, one thing is you're like, wait a second, that's not your email address. There's a little bit of odd functionality here. Um, when you do username or user principal name in the desktop, it brings back your domain and username. But once this is published to the service, it does bring back the actual user principal name. 
So here, let me actually save this uh, roll. We're going to do this right here. We're going to say, look at the actual user principal name and find a match for it in this table for this column. So let's say it's me. It's going to find mcantana at pragmaticworks.com, and then that's only user ID 2. So that is naturally going to filter the provider bridge table. So we say, okay, the next matchup, so we can make sure there's valid values, is whatever is going to remain from the provider ID and then the hospital gener uh, general information provider ID. With those two lookup criteria, bring back whatever is left for our provider IDs. This is going to allow us with whether, and we saw the list. It was like Mitchell, Devin. Let's look at that table again um, right here or right here. PW Demo is in there. He's number four, you know, whatever that sees. But the idea is whoever's logged in is going to see things differently, right? So this would be a way that we could implement some dynamic row level security. If I go ahead and just publish this out here, let's go with learn with the nerds. Publish that out here. Now, once again, the role is there. Um, we still have to assign users to the role. And don't forget, once again, I'm using individual users for this, right? Because the, the whole process of still assigning access, like who should be evaluated for these rules, you still need to do that. You still need to say, because right now, if I give access to PW Demo again to this, it, Power BI doesn't know what rules to apply. So I still need to make them part of the rules, right? That's how you can set different rules for different people. In this case, when Pragmatic Works Demo accesses this report, we're going to use this lookup functionality that's in the background to so decide what can they see. And let's not forget also, I'm assigning Pragmatic Works Demo uh, row level security role. This doesn't grant access to the report. So I need to still do that, right? So now they have access to it. I'm going to do that same thing where I'm going to give direct access to this just like I did before. Do, 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 do. Oh, that's not what I want to do. I want to go here and give direct access to Mr. PW Demo. I'm going to make them read only again. <clears throat> but now, um, and you can see if I go to that report, right, this is everything. Off the top of my head, I can't remember uh, what all Mr. PW Demo can see, but we're about to find out. Let's go over here. No, no, no. There. Let's go here and check out uh, that report. Let me maximize this. That's not the right one. Let's go. It's four dash. We want the right one. Not there yet. In a second, go back and make sure that I shared it correctly. Oh, that was direct access to this data set. Let's not forget, I accidentally did that there. I'm actually going to go ahead and, uh, yeah, make sure that I actually give access to the report. So granularity, that was the example I talked about before. Technically now, um, <laughs> I gave read-only access just to the data set on that one. That's a little silly. I actually want to make sure I give PW Demo access to the actual report. All right. Let's go and find it. Should be pretty quick. There we go. And now you can see this has changed, right? It's reading Pragmatic Works Demo. And we can see there is an adjustment here. Oh, yeah, we only see the U.S., right? My view of this report was, um, I think everything. I had international stuff going on there, too. Yeah, so you can see very clearly the difference between the two. This is when PW Demo logs in. If I were to share this with Devin, if I was to share, well, Devin's a little weird because he's part of the workspace, so technically Devin would see this exactly the same, even if I added him to a role for role of security because he's a workspace admin he supersedes all of that but the other individuals that we saw as part of that user table if, when they log in if i give them access we're going to do that lookup either we find you in that table or we don't and when we do find you it's going to tell me exactly what you're supposed to see 
this is definitely the far more efficient way to go. So you don't have to have a ton of roles. You basically just manage that security table. Now, in the example that we're going through here, that was all kind of created and maintained inside of an Excel workbook. But this could obviously be something that's housed or supported in something like an Azure SQL database. But it literally has to have those instructions. Who are we looking for and what should they be able to see? You just manage and maintain that. And now you just have the one role. So it's pretty cool, pretty nifty on how we can go that route and really make this set where now you as a report writer can create those more kind of holistic reportings that you can share with now a varying different degree of audience while maintaining A can only see what A should see, B should only see what B can see, and so on and so on and so on. So RLS, fun stuff. Don't forget also though that you can do this um, at higher inter levels too. So like I said, SQL Server, Azure Analysis Services, those tools do support RLS. So it might be a consideration to kind of implement that at a higher level. Let me make sure, check my chat. Okay, we're okay there. And let's see, we're kind of getting near the end of that time there. So what I'm gonna do is um, I'm gonna go into my, some governance for auditing, kind of getting documentation. There was a question earlier and we talked about data flows. Uh, timing wise, I might have been a little overzealous in what we could cover here. So what I'll do is I'll follow up because that'll probably be a piece that we won't get to is we always have uh, pretty much daily new YouTube videos on our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, maybe we'll post a link for that so you have that as well. Uh, I'll do a video standalone on uh, if you were here and you were interested in deployment pipelines. I'll do a quick little segment and video on deployment pipelines and how you can implement those. So just keep that in mind, as I don't think we're going to get to it here in the next 15 minutes. Um, governance and auditing, though, really important stuff. We talked about the tenant settings. This is a critical piece of the puzzle. My goodness, is there a ton of settings here? Usage metrics, users, audit logs, tons of stuff that you can access in this area. This only continues to grow. Definitely a critical piece to this puzzle that you need to do. Because we already talked about publish to web. That's a no-no, right? That could be some bad stuff going on there. There's also the ability of allowing users to export data via CSV or Excel. Now, granted, this is something that actually can be controlled at a report level. You can actually do it in Power BI Desktop. But if you just want to take care of it across the board and you don't want that option to be done, you would do it in the tenant settings. So you can see a couple of examples. If you invite external users to your organization, it's pretty big. If that's just turned on and I have a report and I just type in somebody's email address, it doesn't matter who, it technically will send them an email to share this report. But if they're not part of the organizational tenant, it will actually involve an, uh, the process of getting invited to the organization, right? This is pretty important. So that all of the things you see here are just a few important drop in the bucket tenant settings that are critical to kind of observe and decide as an organization, what do we need to control? What do we need to implement? So the location for this, right? This, we don't actually have to go. Technically this does tie in to the actual um, offer. You're gonna see the, the admin center here in a moment, but we can do primarily most of this right here in the admin portal in this browser. So you can see when I go to admin portal, tenant settings is the first. And I'm just gonna show you real quick. There are a ton of options. It just keeps growing. It's nice having that granularity, but you know maybe they'll change the UI here a bit because it's getting a little bit cumbersome at this point, uh, but everything's in here, right? You don't want people to be able to publish to the web. This is where you're gonna find that option, right? If we just kind of move down this real quick, this is just some help and support stuff. Um, technically the get help button right here. You can actually change some of these links um, so that they go where you want them to go. So that's an interesting one that you can actually do for this. It's kind of a fun one. The ability of allowing users to create workspaces straight up. You can either enable it or disable it, but notice there's also the apply to. So you could enable this, but only enable it for a specific set of security groups. Or you can do this little checkbox and you can say, hey, I want everyone to be able to do this except for this security group. So multiple ways. Maybe you turn it off um, and specify, you know what, this is how it's going to be. I don't want anyone to be able to do this. So you have that control of how you want this to be able to. 
use data sets across workspaces. Remember that whole file copy? And I said, hey, you can have your report over here and your data set in this different workspace. That is something you can limit if you do not want that to occur. If we continue down this list here, right, we're going to find published to web. It even has um, like an eye to draw attention, but this is a big one. Obviously here at Pragmatic Works, we do a lot of stuff demo wise. So we do leverage published to web, but for an organization to have everyone here have the ability to go into whatever report they want and hit, oh, you know what? What's this fun little option here? Publish to web public? Now, Power Bay does a pretty good job of giving you warning saying, hey, 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 you are literally creating a link that is going to have access to the public web. Like there a long time ago at this point, someone had gone through the process of using Python to scroll through the web and they created a Power BI report that all it had was a single table. It was a table that had the name of the organization, the name of the report, and the URL to go to that report. It was just to showcase how many people were accidentally using Publish to Web to show private confidential data for the organization. It was happening tons, right? So this is a great, this is where you turn it off. Limit it to who can do it or just turn it off in its entirety more specifics around that embed, you actually can go over here and notice there's embedded codes. This will show you. So right now in the organization, you can see what's going on in this page. Uh, we have one, two, three, was it seven, six? Um, yeah, six uh, published to web links here. You can see who's published them. And if it was, if it's not correct, you can go in here and just straight up delete it, right? So there is visibility of this. So you can see what's going on and maybe make some remedies. But there is just everything. Do you want to allow people to be able to export to Excel, to export to CSV, to be able to download the reports, right? We saw that as an option. Almost everything imaginable can be located here inside of this. And I've seen them make far more of an effort here than it was historically, because like I said, this option, uh, where did you go? Didn't exist for a while. And it was a very clear and obvious problem. So generally when new features come out, when it's service specific, there'll generally be some associated element in the service. For instance, down at the bottom, you can see data marts, which is new and premium, very popular. Some organizations are going to want the limit to users who can leverage that. It's a premium only capability. Quick measures is a new item also that's in play using the Q&A engine to uh, like create DAX measures for you. So you type out what you're looking for and it creates DAX. I can tell you this is a pretty early stage. So some organizations might not want users to leverage this feature because it might not curate the right DAX. It even says it in the feature like, hey, make sure you validate this. But you know, if you just turn it on, people might just take advantage of it and the DAX is being written may not be correct. So this is a way that you can limit who can do what. There's a lot going on inside of this tenant settings. And this is where you will control almost everything that we were discussing as far as what we see in workspaces, how users interact with it, how users interact with dashboards and reports. It can all be found right here. The, the admin portal also contains great usage message. They've made some very nice enhancements to this. These are usage metrics for your entire portal, the tenant itself. So you get some cool information here. You also, as long as you have access within a workspace, you can get metrics at a reporting level. So obviously there's not much going on in this these reports because I literally just published them, but you can see that there is the ability for usage metrics. So how many people have looked at it? When was it last looked at? When was it last refreshed? They've actually made enhancements to these metrics as well. This used to be a pretty big weak spot for Power BI, but I think they've definitely improved it. So as you can see, it literally creates like a little data set in the background. And you know, there's some cool elements in here you can go into. This is such a, I just literally deployed it. So obviously there's no usage here, but very effective area for metrics that they've vastly improved upon. Our list of users here, if we wanna go into this, you manage this inside of the Office 365 Admin Center. I actually already have shown you that. That's the area where we can go ahead and do active users and groups. That's where it takes you. But if you go to the audit logs, this takes us to the Admin Center, but in a different area, right? Service and compliance. Um, this is one of the ways you can go about it, but this, and you can see I did a search earlier. There are actually a ton of potential activities that you can lean into. Right. So if we go in here, we can look at the activity that I did before was a search between November 21st to December 1st. And you can kind of see it. 
There it is. Um, view dashboard, create dashboard, edit dashboard. These are all the activities that I decided I wanted to look at. The list is massive. You can see, you know, apparently, you know, on November 30th, Mitchell created a Power BI report. He called it failed banks. We can see that some, you know, um, that's Hans Angelica. She was looking at uh, viewing a couple dashboards in here. So, you know, there's me. I did something. I created a report called test on the 22nd, apparently. Like I said, you just can limit this, the search. And I do like the new option, right? The new search I really like. But look at these activities, right? File and page activities, folder activities, right? There's way more beyond just Power BI. If you're looking for something like Power BI, you've got to type it in, right? you got to use the filter because this will bring you to just the Power BI activities. But this list of options and selections are massive, once again, just within Power BI. I mean, look at all this. Looking at who's restored a workspace, updated a workspace, uh, exported Power BI activity events, right? Stuff related to data sets, going into things like removing group members, doing stuff with data flows. There is a massive list that you can choose here for activities. It stores those searches down below so you can have those items there for future usage. Um, if you want to, you, know, you can see there's other filter criteria. I definitely like this more than the classic search. Um, this is definitely something that uh, you can lean into and you can leverage. So it's right there. Once again, got to have those elevated permissions in order to achieve it. And there are quite a few other items in here, right? If you do have premium capacity, notice here, we don't have that inside of Power BI. So it'll say, hey, you don't have it. If you want it, you can purchase. And we've already seen what that looks like, right? Where we went in here, you can actually go to purchase services. That takes us to the same exact spot. But if we did have Power BI Premium, it would actually showcase whatever nodes we have. You can invite users to it. You could set some settings for capacity limitations. Premium, of course, has its own kind of nuances to it. But this admin portal, this is where a lot of times we see that segmentation and kind of where we've been traversing through the, the compliance center, the OP365 center. We've gone all over the place here. Uh, sometimes that is separate as far as responsibilities with an organization versus simply just Power BI administration, mainly the tenant settings, right? You can invite users and get them set inside of the admin portal. Technically, you can make people Power BI admins and they don't actually have to have a pro license to administer this. Licensing, once again, mainly correlates to workspaces, but a lot of different things we can get into here. I mean, there's just so much. There really is so much when it comes to this, um, but we are getting here to the end of the session. We have about four minutes left. So like I said, the one big element that I was unable to, but you guys do have in your slide deck was the element around um, actual uh, uh, the pipelines. So I'll get, I will do a standalone follow-up to this on YouTube on um, pipelines, deployment pipelines. Um, and we talked about it already briefly. We talked about it in the concept of being able to move items around. So you can see real quick, like I have a pipeline and you can see the different objects that exist within it, right? This has two data sets, three reports. It's a pretty cool way so that you can move. So if you wanted to, literally, if I hit deploy, it'll take what exists here. Here's some new objects. Here's an object that exists, but it's different. And it will move it over to this workspace. That's called demo test. You do need premium workspaces for this though, but... It's a really cool built-in element right here. And once again, as of November, they have integrated some Azure DevOps integration here. So if that is something you prefer, uh, that is a direction and route that you can take. So I'll do a little more to go in depth into this. Um, but to be honest, I mean, and this is almost like with every Learn with the Nerds, we're just trying to get you enticed and into the area of administration for Power BI. But Power BI is massive. And you see, we traversed multiple areas, even going beyond Power BI, and there's even more to discover, right? There's even more to go into, but this was just trying to lay that foundation, kind of show you the different realms and areas um, that you can get involved with, right? So hopefully, you know, this was helpful. Um, we do have an entire Power BI administration class on the on-demand learning, which extends on this one even further because there's obviously no time limitation there. And for, I, I can't remember the name and I apologize for this, but for the user who was inquiring as to the Power BI report server administration, we had a quick question on that. We have an entire class on report server administration as well. So don't forget to sign up. Um, you can check that out if you like. And then, you know, if you love us, which I know you will, 
don't forget you've got that limited time uh, for purchasing that license at that discounted rate for those new subscribers. So definitely check it out. Um, I'll give you a little hint and a tidbit. Um, uh, we're, I'm, I'm actually, I actually just finished recording a introduction to Power BI Data Marts, and that's going to be coming up there shortly as well. So we, we try to stay right on the edge of what's going on, what's new, what's updated. So, you know, definitely check it out. Uh, we update things. I can't tell you how many times, uh, Devin could probably tell you how many times I've updated the intro to Power BI class because that's always changing. And I think that's over like 20 hours of recorded content. So I think you guys will greatly enjoy. I know some of you who are with us, who've been with our family for, for years now in ODL, hopefully you're still enjoying that product. We get emails from them all the time. They give us advice and we make updates and changes because we interact with those members who are, are part of our family there in ODL. We get feedback and I think sometimes it surprises new users when they watch like my videos, let's say, and they send a feedback and I'm the one who responds to them. I mean, I, we're involved all the way down to that level. So uh, we'd like to be part of the process. So I'm one minute off, guys, right here at the end. Um, I'll check and see any 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 kind of lingering questions that might be out there, Devin, that you um, might want to kind of finish up on or. No, I think you're good. Um, I mean, there's definitely loads and loads and loads of questions and impossible to keep up with. So my apologies if we weren't able to get uh, to every one of them. But um, great job, Manuel. Appreciate it. Uh, as you've seen on the uh, kind of overlays on top of our face here, you can see our, our sale that uh, Manuel mentioned a couple of times. And then also just to mention as well, we do have uh, a shorter session coming up with Matt Peterson. That's a lunch with the nerds. Uh, that's an hour and a half session. That's going to be focusing in on the AI capabilities built in the Power BI. Uh, so that one is on the screen now. In case you'd like to join us for that, uh, that would be uh, next month. So no, great job, Manuel. I'll, I'll hand it to you to sign off. Cool. Well, as always, guys, thank you so much. Um, you know, you guys are with me for the three hours. We appreciate it. I know this one, we try We try to always be interactive with Devin feeding me questions and answering those, but there's so many of you on the call, it makes it just so uh, much more difficult. So don't forget, um, check out that those items, guys, on-demand learning. Um, also, we do have virtual mentoring. That literally gets you one-on-one -on -one time with um, myself and other of the trainers uh, to help with certain technical needs. So definitely check out the services we have there. Uh, and if you maybe represent potentially a large organization, like you're attending this event and you've got team members, you know, there's other areas, people in the department that are interested in stuff like this. Of course, we do do private training as well as public training. So, you know, make sure you check out all of those different services. So thank you so much. Um, I greatly appreciate it. I uh, hope you guys have a great rest of the day. And even though it's not Friday, you'll get there. I hope you have a